Okay, uh, if council members can turn on their cameras. Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome to our 2.30 p.m. session of the September 27th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members, Kalantari Johnson. Present. Holder. Here. Cummings. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkin. Here. And Mayor Bernard. Present. Before we begin with our agenda and our presentations, I would like to take a moment of silence regarding the Iranian protests and deaths this last week, 57 deaths since Sunday, and supporting Iranian women and condemning the acts of the Iranian government. Okay, thank you. I would also like to thank uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, and I would like to just offer you a space to say anything to that. Thank you, thank you for the moment of silence and the acknowledgement. Um, I wanna announce that the um, students at UCSC are um, organizing, have organized a vigil tonight on campus at the Quarry Plaza at 7 p.m. It's student-led, um, but all are invited. And um, I'd like to propose to the mayor and the council that we, uh, at the next agenda, um, vote on a statement, and I'd like to read the draft of the statement today, right now, if that's okay. Okay. Um, the Santa Cruz City Council releases the following statement on the death of Masa Amini and the ensuing protests and Iranian security forces response. The Santa Cruz City Council stands in solidarity with the people of Iran as they rise up in protest against the brutal and needless death of Masa Amini, a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman who died after sustaining injuries while in police custody for alleged violations of Iran's oppressive dress code. These dress codes impose on women strict requirements not applied to men and expose even conservatively dressed women to the arbitrary whims and notorious brutality of Iran's security services. In killing Massa, the Iranian government is implying that dress code is more valuable than the life of a woman. We're shocked and saddened by the violent and overly aggressive response of Iran's security services to the protest against Massa Amini's death, which at last report on Sunday September 25th has resulted in a minimum of 57 deaths and countless injuries and arrests. It's important to note that my body, my cho choice goes both ways. Bodily autonomy is a human right, whether a woman chooses to wear the hijab or not. It should be her personal decision. Let it be known that the regime is not a reflection of Islam, but a reflection of abusive power. The women in Iran deserve better. We, the Santa Cruz City Council, stand in solidarity with the courageous people in Iran protesting. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Okay, um, we will continue on with our agenda. Thank you. Um, yeah. Do we need to take any action about putting that on our agenda. Thank you so much. Um, just want to make I sure don't think we that. need to. I can no. okay, set it on great. the Just yeah. Wanted thank to make you, sure. thank Council you. Member Brown. <clears throat> okay, welcome. We will now begin with our first presentation item, Agenda Six: Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project. Our quarterly update of where we're at with that uh, presenting by Director of Economic Development, Bonnie Lipscomb, welcome. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, Council members. Um, it's 
Good to be in front of you today again for another quarterly update. Um, Brian Borguno, who is our project manager uh, for the Downtown Library and Affordable Housing Project, will actually be leading the majority of the presentation. Um, I'll come in briefly just to give an update on the farmer's market and the housing funding. Um, but the last time we came before you was in May. And um, this is roughly just an update from that time. A lot has happened. There is a lot of detail, um, but I just want to let you know that this will update will be available on our website under our project page, as well as all the accompanying documents. Um, we're going to go through this rather quickly, recognizing this is a presentation update, um, but happy to follow up with any questions that you have, um, either within the context of the presentation or later. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Brian Borguno, who is our project manager. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Bonnie. And I just want to make sure I've got good audio and that you all can hear me right now. We can hear and you. Thank that, you. And that you can now see my presentation screen and are able to view um, the main page slide. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity today to give you an update on all the progress that we've made on the downtown library and affordable housing project. So I'm going to go through our agenda and we've got like as Bonnie indicated, pretty heavy content because there's been a lot of moving parts since the last time we were before you, but we're going to try to touch on some of the major milestones and information that we think is most relevant. Um, so the agenda today is going to be a highlight of our recent efforts to date, um, the update on the design and community feedback uh, that we received at a recent community meeting, uh, update on the farmer's market, budget update, project schedule update, and next steps. So jumping right into the recent efforts. So as of as of now, we have submitted a formal application for the planning department uh, through our affordable housing developer for the future housing um, that was submitted in early, earlier in September. Um, we had a community presentation on that application design that was held on the 21st. Um, and we've been completing a number of benchmark reports. So our phase one cultural resources inventory draft report is under review. Uh, we just received our phase one slash two environmental site work um, that was completed in draft report We've undertaken a traffic impact analysis that is underway and near completion. We're expecting a final report here in the coming weeks. Um, we received a finalized arborist report and report addendum. Um, and the design team for the library, which is a separate architecture firm for the tenant improvements, has completed their 100% design development set and has submitted that to the city for review. Um, and unfortunately, we received notice that we did not receive round one funding for the state library grant opportunity. Um, but we are looking to apply for the second round funding. They have awarded about 50% of the available budget uh, for those grant opportunities. So a brief overview of, of some of the highlights from the Arborist report, because I know there's been a lot of interest in this. Uh, nine of the 12 trees on the site are classified as heritage trees, meaning that at the specified diameter of 14 inches at a certain height uh, in measurement, that those trees would be considered heritage tree by classification. All 12 of those trees are non-native um, and exhibit uh, a, very, a various of components of detrimental conditions and are in conflict with the current construction footprint. So some of those conditions that were called out by the arborist are you know, restricted growing areas, severe pruning, structural weakness, evidence of past failures, limb and stem decay, and unfortunately, you know, buried root collars that may disguise additional root disease as well as additional decay. Um, of the 12, two trees were identified as viable for transplant, uh, and only one of those is designated heritage, but relocation was not recommended for a couple of reasons, one of which the health conditions of the root structure is unknown, and they may not survive transplanting. Um, and secondly, after our city arborist had reviewed some of the information, uh, she felt that we could get healthier trees at a lower cost option than transplanting the unhealthy trees on site. Um, so part of the application process for the planning department, uh, we will be required to submit a separate heritage tree removal permit application. And so that is going to be submitted in the near future and have a separate track process um, for requesting removal of those trees. Uh, the arborist report along with the addendum will be posted to the project website. So if, if people want to dive into the additional details, those will be made available. So an update on the design. So some of these images at the beginning are just going to be kind of a refresher so that we can kind of walk you through the progress that we've made. So back in uh, December of last year, we brought the conceptual design as it evolved through community engagement and feedback. Um, and we landed on a conceptual design that kind of changed the programmatic footprint elements um, of the design. 
um, of which you approved in December. And then we moved from this on to schematic design, which we brought some of these images to you back at our last update of the downtown library facade and the building as it's starting to evolve from concept to schematic. And now we've further progressed those designs and some of these updated renderings, which included different architectural elements, um, more of a landscaping plan, color, you know, different features that are starting to become more predominant as we continue to evolve the, the design as a whole. So this is just another image from a different vantage point along uh, Cedar Street, focusing on the library facade, but you can start to see that the elements of the housing are starting to become more apparent. So the update on the design as a whole, you know, right now the library gross area uh, stands at 38,000 square feet with the rooftop patio adding an additional 3,200 square feet of programmable space. So the library total square footage at this point is 41,309 square feet. Uh, the project contains bicycle parking of 258 bike locker locations or stands. So it's a combination of enclosed um, lockers as well as racks. A parking stall count of 243 spaces a housing unit count of 124 units, a daycare slash play area that combined um, equals about 1,900 square feet, and commercial space on the corner uh, of 9,598 feet. So this is a view of the landscaping elements that are starting to become more apparent. Um, currently, we have uh, 13 street trees identified on the perimeter of the building and a number of plantable areas. And those continue on to the upper level um, that is kind of the entryway on the third floor to the residential units, as well as our you know, nearly 9,000 square foot green roof um, over top of the library. There's another vantage point that kind of shows you that we have other plentiful areas that can include smaller species of trees and shrubs, um, as well as kind of a view of what the, the green roof might look like from a bird's eye view. Um, and just a reminder, as it stands now, we have you know three levels of parking, uh, five levels of housing on top, and the adjacent uh, library and commercial use space. So information is currently you know, being updated on an ongoing basis to our project webpage. And for those that aren't familiar with that, uh, the short URL is cityofsantacruz.com slash mixed-use library. Um, we continue to update all our information on the design set and any anything that we are going to be posting there. Um, relative to the planning application is going to also be posted on that web page. Um, we gave a presentation to the community on uh, September 21st, and that slide deck is available now. Uh, we're expecting to compile some of the feedback as well as the video and questions and answers and, and just kind of post all of that feedback available to the public um, by the end of this week. Um, and the planning application documentation will also be posted there for, for public review and input. A general overview of the community feedback we received at our community meeting. Uh, the meeting consisted of planning staff, project staff, our affordable housing partner, and their architect team. We had approximately 65 participants. It was a webinar format with a Q&A. We had 46 plus responses to eight survey questions. A majority of those responses were positive. Um, and then we facilitated question and answer for about 45 minutes, which was about half the time we allotted for this meeting. Um, and uh, unfortunately, had to you know stop it towards the end. But we plan on posting any questions we didn't answer. We'll we'll respond to and make sure that they're available for those that didn't have their questions answered. Um, those questions ranged uh, on a variety of topics. A lot of people were interested in the housing components and specific things around rent, uh, childcare, the library, uh, parking count, bicycle parking. It was, it was definitely a spectrum of questions that we answered. Uh, these were the survey questions that we asked. I'm not going to read them verbatim just for the sake of making sure that we have enough time today to get to your questions and answers, but to give you kind of an idea of some of the topics that we covered um, and as a quick overview of you know some of the feedback that we received. So when we asked what aspect of the project are you most excited about, you know, a majority of the responses focused on housing and library, and there was a few uh, highlights of some of the, the direct feedback that we, read, we, we received from the participants that attended. Um, when we kind of summed it up in yes or no, like does the design meet your expectations? We had 34 that said yes and or exceeded, 13 that said no, that we were not meeting their expectations and one person that was unsure. And now I'm gonna turn it over to, to Bonnie Lipscomb to kind of talk about the farmer's market and lead off the budget update. Great, thanks Brian. So, the next slide. 
Um, so just to update you from May, we have been working regularly with the executive team from the farmer's market, Nate Dillon, um, as well as with his board over the summer to really bring um, a lot of the designs from 27, 2018 that we've been working with on lot seven, bring it up to 2022 and where, where the farmer's market is currently, what their goals are for permanence long-term. And um, we have been working throughout, you know, late spring, early summer um, on designs. Um, we're at the point where we're close to a final design for lot seven. And at the same time, we've been working on a farmer's market mem memorandum of understanding. And some of the main objectives for the uh, MOU with the farmer's market is for permanence for the farmer's market. So a permanent location and structure, improved site and enhanced community space over what they have currently. They also are really looking at year round op operations. So not to be impacted by rainy weather, inclement weather as well as an expansion of what they currently offer. And so they're looking at special food trucks, um, special community events, potentially even increasing the farmer's market to twice a week. So really looking at how can we truly make this a community gathering space more than just one afternoon, one Wednesday afternoon each week. So um, we have this outlined in an MOU. Um, we currently also have um, City Council, you have approved um, 1.775 million, 1.2 from a previous budget year, an additional 500,000 this year um, that is budgeted for farmer's market for permanent, um, some phase one improvements. And we're specifically looking at lot seven based on um, our current communications with um, the farmer's market board. So the proposal, next slide, um, is the MOU has been reviewed by the Farmers Market Board. We have um, had a presentation on the design and layout. You can see just some excerpts um, here of some of the recent work that we've done with the Farmers Market and with the board um, that was presented to them in August. Um, this August, um, we've received feedback into, on both the design and working on the finalized design right now as well as have the final comments on the MOU. Um, we are anticipating, hopefully it'll be next week, um, if not next week, the week after that the farmer's market will be voting on um, the MOU um, with the feedback that we've received. So we really have made a lot of progress um, and we'll bring that forward to you. Um, after it goes to the farmer's market board, we'll come back to the city council for your consideration of that memorandum of understanding. I also want to give you just some brief budget updates since May. Um, and so we're not going to go into in May, we went um, pretty, we did a pretty big deep dive into the library budget uh, breakdown of um, the various elements, the design, tenant improvements over the overall budget comparison to the renovation budget. What we're going to do today is just update you on some of the recent updates, both um, per the project elements. So specifically um, on, thank you, on housing, and then I'll turn it back to Brian to talk a little bit about uh, parking and the library itself. So updates since May, um, specifically what we have secured to date. And when I say we, this is specifically our overall team, but this is largely public city secured funding. Um, the local housing trust fund, um, we have 3.6 um, million secured specifically for this project for affordable housing. We also have a um, permanent local housing allocation of 1.55 secured for this project, um, specifically at this location. We have 2 million secured, a congressional earmark, um, thanks to um, Congressman Panetta. And that's both for the housing and the library components of the project. And then additionally, um, through Eden, uh, one of the developer teams, um, we do have a grant from Central Coast Community Energy for the net zero elements of the project for 240,000. So secured to date is over 7 million, seven, basically 7.4 million specifically for the housing, a little overlap between the housing and the library on the earmark. Um, to be secured, and I just wanted to just take a second to, to pause on where we are with the fact that we have over 7 million secured, secured for housing at this point in the project. And when I say this point in the project, we have just submitted you know, this month the formal application for the project. So to already have 7 million secured in, in funding sources for housing is pretty unusual. It's very early for that. I, for um, what you see under to be secured, um, the developer, once they have entitlement, so once city council, when you get this project, hopefully in December before you, once you grant um, 
and approve the overall project. The developer is then able to apply for the majority of funding um, that you really pull together for the various funding sources for affordable housing development. And so we've been working really closely with Eden and for the future and sure that we're lining up to apply um, in January, February next year for the Supernova application. Following that, um, we'll be able to apply for tax credits. We're anticipating approximately a conventional perm loan for another 78 million and then affordable housing program funds will really round out the full picture um, for the affordable housing funding that will be secured for this project. And next slide. And when we look at the housing, um, in order to apply for a lot of those, we had to early on, and Eden really put this together, is look at that, uh, the unit count, the unit mix, and the affordability mix. And some of our goals as the city and our affordable housing team is to make sure that we as a city and as a public entity are providing the greatest need and the hardest um, hardest to build in the community. That's really where you, you know, want to focus the majority of your dollars and your leveraging for affordable housing. So we are really focusing on 30 to 50% for the majority of our focus of area median income and um, a few units at 60% AMI, but we're not focusing at what's considered low income, which is 80% of area median income. We're going lower because those are the most expensive units to build. Therefore, we really wanna leverage our affordable dollars in that, in that area. So that 7 million, 7.4 that I went on the previous slide is really being leveraged to create these units in the project. And the breakdown is just before you, 31 three bedroom units, 31 two bedroom, 48 one bedroom, 13 studios, and one two bedroom manager's unit. And we've had a lot of just questions and follow up recently about, well, what does that mean? It's pretty complicated when you start talking about 30% to 60% of AMI. So I just put in there what that range is. And this, this does, does change each year based on the state level from housing and community development. They print out um, and we can go through uh, forward and really go and take a deeper dive of this at a future meeting. I think we're gonna focus on a housing topic and we can go into the formula of how these are, are determined each year, what these ranges are and what you need to qualify. But basically in order to be eligible to come into our 27 of these units that are reserved for those making 30% of area median income, it ranges between a sort of a studio or one person income of earning roughly 32,000 a year up to a three bedroom unit, which assumes, you know, two, two, you know, sort of wage earners potentially up to 46,000 a year. So that's what you would need to be eligible for one of the 30% um, AMI units. So um, that's a, an update on the housing and I will turn it over to Brian to give you an update on the budgets as far as parking and the library. Thank you. So this slide might look familiar to, to those that were um, involved with some of the previous meetings, but basically the parking budget's been shuffling as the design changes. And so right now this parking financing um, kind of overview is based on the current design that is in the application. Um, and so that consists of 243 parking spaces. Some previous discussions we've presented design concepts that had higher parking count, but at this point we have three levels of parking and 243 parking spaces as we began to shuffle things around to accommodate needs for fire in the alley, and as we carved out mechanical components and, and other elements related to infrastructure that was needed. Um, and so at this point, we've estimated that that service would be about 1.1 million annually, and the amount finan of financing that we would need for the, for the parking component would be about 14.5 14, 14 million, which is reduced based on the space count. Um, we still have to determine the best financing options as we get closer to having to secure this financing, which we won't do until we're further along and have entitlements and are starting to look at a realistic construction schedule. Um, we don't wanna have funding secured too early and have to start paying um, debt service on, on money that we haven't built a facility that helps support that debt service. And so the timing of that is still kind of down the road at this point. Um, there are a couple of different options. You know, the, the parking district has the ability to do district bonds, um, but there's also some direct loan lenders that have worked with government entities that we've been in discussions with. Um, so, Funding will be secured at a later date, but these are the, the updated estimates of what we would expect. Um, when it comes to the debt service, it, it's important to remind, I think everyone, it, it's, there's, there's still been some confusion about like how does this funding you know, evolve? And it's a combination of the facility itself will produce revenues as well as the parking district as a whole has always supported debt service for the parking district. 
And so those two uh, revenue streams combined will give us the ability to meet the annual debt service. Um, and we're updating all of our financial modeling that we used to prove this concept back in 2018 with an outside firm um, because we've had impacts related to COVID. We've done things to impact revenue by providing temporary relief to businesses and waiving fees. Um, a number of different things have, have factored in since that last uh, revisit of the financial model. And so those inputs are being updated now to be vetted by a third party to help you know bring any decision making that might need to happen on project design back to the uh, back to the council for consideration. Um, and so we're expecting to have that work done over the next several weeks um, with that happening prior to having um, action on the entitlement process in December. On the library, the library design has has moved a little bit further ahead than the overall um, building envelope. And so at this point, we already have 100% design development TI sets for the for the design because that process has to has a longer lead time to get um, through the community input on collections and you know with the working with the library staff and, and all the elements that affect the library footprint. Um, so like the, the overall building envelope is dialed in, um, but there was a lot of moving parts that affected the timing that we needed to keep working ahead on the library design. Um, so at each interval that we receive a new design set, we get a new cost estimate. And so now we've received, um, in the last couple of weeks, a new base estimate that has brought the cost down $625,000 from the base estimate that we had at the previous schematic design set. And when we add the alternatives, there's an additional savings. So we're down to base and alternatives being uh, just over $24 million and reduced $830,000 from the last estimate that we received. Uh, a number of the design changes that are affecting this change in cost is related to us bringing the building height down to meet the 50 foot um, maximum on the Cedar Street side. And so there's been some movement on the floor height that has had cost savings on material use um, as the cost estimate has, has been produced. Um, so that's one of the, the things that's helping drive down, you know, as we further design and more known is known, um, we'll continue to fine tune and, and look for ways for cost savings on material use. So the next update is on project schedule. So right now we're still in design development phase um, because we just received that 100% design set to review as the city will provide feedback to the architect team working on the TIs for the library. Um, and then we've started the entitlement process for the overall project uh, building envelope um, to move forward. And so those are the two phases that we're, we're predominantly focused on. Um, post entitlement, there'll be additional design work on the overall building envelope and there'll be uh, transitioning from design development into construction documents across the board um, so that we can meet our construction schedule. And so this is kind of an extended view of kind of, we're still in this you know, year end phase of design and engineering um, and we won't be pivoting to construction until 2024. The next steps. So the project design application planning process is starting to um, you know, materialize as we have the formal application submitted this month. Um, we're targeting a December council meeting for those entitlements to be approved. Um, and then we would begin the next design phases as we hit different benchmarks in, in the entitlement process. Um, the finalizing of the farmer's market MOU, which we're expecting to happen next month, uh, and the finalizing of the farmer's market design at Lot 7. Uh, we anticipate having a second project community meeting as part of the entitlement process, and we're targeting sometime in November prior to it going to the planning commission and before uh, it comes to, back to council for action. Um, and then of course, the reason we're targeting that December meeting is we're hoping to apply for housing funding uh, in January of 2023. And with that, we will take any questions that you might have that we might have answers for. Thank you for that update. Let's see, I'll take it out for uh, any council members who have questions on that quarterly update. Council member, uh, council member Brown and then council member Myers. Thanks. Uh, so uh, thank you for the update. Uh, lots of, lots to chew on there. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if I could follow up on the, the parking piece of this um, because I, I feel like I'm hearing some different information about the financial position of the parking district and the, what that means for the potential to bond, either bond or take the alternative approach if I close that file, sorry. <laughs> um, so 
are we, is the city in a position right now to, um, to finance the parking portion? Um, I, you know, I, Claire Gologli did talk about this at our meeting last Thursday, but I'm still trying to understand where we're at in terms of the potential to finance the parking piece. So um, if we were to, for example, be ready um, to, to move forward now or sometime in the very near future, could we, um, you're confident that the city could finance in that, in that fashion? manner and and you, why are yes. we confident of that given that we don't have an updated financial model yes so i think like the purpose of the financial model is just to prove our assumptions and have them third party vetted and also take into consideration the unknowns that we we might experience like interest rate changes you know how do we approach finance the financial structure in a way that is most beneficial and most efficient for a project um, so at this time, yes, we, we still believe we have the resources and the district is the one that has the ability to bond for its projects and supply projects. It's historically been able to do that in, since its existence. And so we believe because we're kind of coming out of COVID that the revenues have rebounded in such a way where we're getting rid of some of our temporary reductions in fees. We're unwinding some of our temporary measures and we've eaten up some of our cash, our, our flexible cash reserves to do that. Um, but as a whole, we, we do believe that we're on solid ground when it comes to the parking district, and we have been for a, a consistent period of time, that as we go out to, to get competitive interest rates and bond rates and make a determination on how we want to structure the financing, because there is different paths forward, that we will have not only a project that's viable, but one that is competitive with getting secured um, lower interest rates. Thank you. I have a couple of other questions, if I could just get through those. Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to ask specifically about parking, because I'm, I'm curious about the, you know, there's a lot of pieces to this, and there's a lot of different funding sources, and the timing and sequencing of, you know, how and when we get money matters um, for these different components. And um, so um, just trying to think about, you know, do, what we need to have in place in order to... Um, demonstrate what I believe is commonly called shovel readiness uh, to be able to go after some of those additional funding sources. And, um, and I'm thinking now about the housing piece. Um, and so I appreciate how you've laid out what, the, what we have and what the possibilities for additional funding are in, in collaboration with our, our partners. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, I did hear and you n noted in the presentation today that we did not, we were not successful in the last round of funding um, on the, I can't remember what the, fund, the pot of money is called, but the, for the library. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you received comments or if you're, we're, we're applying again and there's a, uh, suggestion or it's been stated that we are going to do we're going to go for the next round did you get comments were there ways that this is or, or what are we doing to make that more competitive i guess to try to get that funding and did you get comments about why we weren't funded in this round um, were there big areas that or anything like that I'm just just curious because i want to make sure we're going after money that we're competitive for yeah, I, I think I can start on a couple components and maybe have Bonnie answer some of the, the housing components. But so from a from an overall project schedule, we, we will really start to shore up the financing post entitlement, um, in part because that's when the housing funding becomes available for us to apply and we have an approved project. And the same is true. We don't want to be too far ahead of when we're starting construction or have too much flexibility in trying to borrow more than we need for construction of the parking garage. And so like in some ways that that really is our next big benchmark to get past that will help us start dialing in securing the financing and applying for uh, the funding for the housing you know starting the process of determining which the financial tool that's best fit for the parking component as well as you know just shoring up you know where do we have potential gaps that need to be identified and what other grant opportunities are there out that we can be competitive for now that we have an approved project i think that's the next big hurdle for us to get through from a project standpoint of giving more certainty around the financial models. Um, and in the meantime, we're doing all our due diligence to make sure that we are trying to be ahead of that by, by working out you know, those inputs and having them vetted through you know, our economic firm that we've worked with in the past that has proven you know, to, to help us 
determine that we can afford you know the parking component and that we have a viable plan and so i think that unless bonnie has additional things to add i think that's our our big benchmark that will really open up the door uh, for us to be more competitive in applying for the financial component thanks brian i would just add to that that we do have a um, million dollars set aside for this project specifically related to parking elements from previous development um, so two development developer contributions of 500,000 a piece um, for future parking related to this project and future parking capacity. So we have ample funding to continue, you know, for the next, you know, I'd say year plus or more um, with that funding set aside for this project related to parking to make sure the parking is paying its fair share. And, you know, as Brian mentioned, you know, we're, we're looking to come before you hopefully in the December timeframe regarding entitlements for the project, um, but the anticipated need to actually start having secured bonds is not until, you know, much later in 2023, if even in 2023, it could even go into 2024. So um, based on um, the parking fund now, and the fact that we're really looking to secure parking revenue bonds, so they're based on, you know, our future revenue. So users that come and park in the parking structure you know, we'll be basically providing the future revenue to pay the, bar the parking fund. So from that perspective and looking at the city's bond rating, the health of the fund over time, we don't believe in and feedback that we've received from our financial consultants is that we're not gonna have any trouble securing the financing we need on the parking side for the project. So I wanna say that now, we'll come back to you with updated models when we have that, um, but we don't have any indication uh, that the feedback from the pandemic is going to ultimately impact our ability to secure financing for the parking. Um, so I think that's something we'll we'll continue to in our quarterly updates or sooner as needed, we'll come to council and, and provide more information to you on that front. Thank you, thank you. One last question. Um, so it, in, in terms of the, I, mean, I, I think about cost escalation, I know we all do. Um, and we, you know, we talked about that a lot and uh, being on, on the library, Committee, we did get some really detailed financial information about the, the specific components to, to get us a cost estimate for you know, and I, it was it was fascinating and um, you know just really helpful to be able to see that information. It was the the financial uh, work that that Mac Five did as part of that uh, study with Jason Architects, and we don't really have. I, I mean, I'm I'm trying to get a sense of what. Um, something comparable would be to try to think through um, the, the cost for the, you know, kind of, we have a big number <laughs> and we have some designs and just thinking about what, what the actual costs are going to be um, and then also trying to factor in cost escalation. I know you, you do that in, um, in planning, but we obviously have had uh, some pretty significant inflationary uh, years here. And so I'm, I'm wondering if we're going to get any additional, um, more detailed cost information, and if we can get, just, I'd, I'd love to have a better understanding of what you're seeing in terms of the cost that we're estimating now versus when building actually begins. And I guess I, two I would respond first, first with the, the, the cost estimations that we're bringing do in, consider cost inflation and cost escalation. And so those those numbers that we're bringing you do factor that in as a future, based on our construction timeline, so at a future start date. Um, and that has been one of the drivers of some of the numbers changing that we've been bringing back to you is that you know, it has impacted the, those, those base costs. Um, as the design furthers, we're offsetting that by, you know, with, with material changes and space count changes and things that are also bringing the cost down. Um, so the numbers that we are bringing to you are what we're expecting to have to spend at the time of construction, not and not excluding those numbers at this point. And I would just add to that, um, just to further, you know, sort of clarify your questions about will we get more updates? You know, as Brian um, really went over earlier, you know, taking it from 50 percent uh, DD to 100 percent actually ultimately resulted in a reduction overall of our TI costs. So we are getting updated at real information as we move forward on each each element, each step in the project, and we'll continue to do that and revise the numbers as we get to each subsequent phase in the project, we will have a new cost estimate, you know, for the various elements. And then ultimately when we get to, you know, construction drawings and then, you know, if we 
move forward in the project, we'll be able to go out to bid and then we'll have an actual, you know, construction edge, you know, estimate and bid for the overall project. So we'll continue to come forward um, at key milestones um, with financial information about the project and the project elements. Thank you. And I was very pleased to see the um, decrease there. <laughs> it's very unusual. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Meyer and then Council Member Cummings. Um, Council Member Brown asked some of my questions, so I'm, I'm, I'll, I think I'm just down to one or two. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess I had a couple, well, real quick question, I, one question remaining about the parking, um, the parking district and the sort of financial solvency. So, you know, some of that, re obviously that revenue loss was um, related to the city actually re pretty much stopping Park, parking fees during COVID, um, so folks, you know, wouldn't be hit with those. So, I think it's important for the public to understand that, you know, when you see that drop in the revenues on our parking district, you know, a lot of that had to do with the fact that we just we just didn't require people to pay to park anymore for uh, during COVID a lot. So, um, but it, you know, again, seeing that we're just building replacement parking, we're not building new parking in that parking garage. Um, but we are consolidating it into that structure. Um, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that, you know, our payback, you know, annual cost is only a million dollars. So it's really not much or 1.1 million. So I'm glad to see these numbers. I'm shocked by the numbers that you've presented today. And I know that there's, it's always hard to estimate on construction, but I think there's, um, you know, a lot, kind of a little bit of misinformation about our possible success on this project and the numbers you're showing me today are, are really encouraging. Um, so Brian, I understood that you did, um, what was the percent escalation figure you used for um, the cost? Was it 10%, 20%? I, I, I haven't fully read it. We just got the 100% design development cost estimation like the end of last week. So I haven't gone over that in full detail, but we could provide that answer to you like the exact numbers that they're using for their cost escalation. I know yeah. we have that available. That would be good to know just because, you know, if, if they're using like, like a 20% escalation that, you know, I feel like that gives us some pretty solid coverage, but if they're using like a 10 or 15, it's pretty standard, I think nowadays to do 20, but I'd be just curious to know what that is. Cause I know construction costs are all over the map right now. So yeah, but I can follow up with you on an email on that, but um, really encouraging numbers. And so thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Council Member Cummings. Thanks for that presentation. Um, I'll try to keep my questions short. Um, the one question that I've been hearing people bring up is, you know, we've talked about funding for library, parking, um, the housing, but the commercial space and the childcare, I'm just wondering, is that funding coming out of the funding for the library or where the funding's coming from to incorporate those pieces into this project? Uh, so the commercial, um, actually project. So what one of the things we're doing is we are as part of the overall building envelope is looking at what the cost or value of the existing commercial building is and um, creating a condo within the project as one option for that value. And then any subsequent value for the space um, will be made up by the business owner if he's interested in in securing that space. So um, that's something that we'll bring forward to you. We've been actively sort of working with the business owner about um, it, it really is right now an expansion, um, almost double the size of space that he has now. So there's real value created through the project. It's not a component of the library um, or any of the library share at all. It's a, a portion on the housing project footprint. Um, and so looking at um, as part of what you can as far as land acquisition, it's part of that piece for the affordable housing and it's um, actually underneath the affordable housing um, component of the project. Um, on the childcare, that's something that um, is critically needed in all housing projects for um, housing and particularly for affordable housing. Um, so that's another element that um, actually helps in some of our funding applications for affordable housing, being able to secure some of that. So. Um, that's something that we've been working very closely with the with the developer on as we go forward. Great, that's helpful. Um, the next question I had was on lot seven and the potential um, for the farmers market to move there, and that's obviously 
dependent upon the outcome of the Measure O campaign. But I'm just curious because I was just looking at the timeline and let's say, for example, this project continues to move through um, after November. When would, the, when would we anticipate the construction on Lot 7 to take place to create those structures that were kind of outlined for shading? Because it would seem to be that we'd want to have all that completed before any construction began on Lot 4. Because if, the, if it wasn't complete, then the farmer's market really doesn't have anywhere to go. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could speak to that in terms of the timeline, depending on the outcome of the November election. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking that question. You know, one of the options we're talking about with the farmers market, they're really interested in pursuing lot seven um, as a potential permanent home, but also potentially as an interim home. Um, they want to really keep that option open um, if measure O does fail and they can look um, forward to the current library site. So right now they want to keep both options open, which would mean that for lot four, and the interim, we would resurface, do some, you know, utilities, grading, um, you know, initial phase up, you know, upgrades to make that parking lot a really great site for the farmer's market. But we would stop short of doing the structure in that scenario and in that option. If farmer's market um, moves um, after we, you know, resurface, repave, which could happen, you know, well within the, the next year, because that scope is a much, as a first phase, is a much shorter, much smaller scope and very achievable particularly within the budget funding that we have, um, they can decide, hey, we actually really like it here. I mean, that option's going to be theirs, whether they want to stay on lot seven or ultimately whether they want to focus on the current library site should that opportunity come forward in the future. Got it. So I guess with keeping that option open, then it's going to be a little bit of a challenge if they decide they want to stay on lot seven and then what happens while this, these structures get constructed. And specifically, just to follow up on your question, do you mean the surrounding private development? No, on Lot 7, if the, the, the schematics that the city's kind of laid out, if that's not done prior to them moving to create that permanent space, if they decide they want Lot 7 as a permanent space, I guess the question would be, like, where would they go in the interim while that construction takes place? Yeah, what we're looking at is um, potentially for the uh, preliminary first phase is to go ahead and put some of the pilings and foundations that would support the, the permanent structure. It's just a matter of putting in those um, concrete footings um, initially when we're repaving the lot. And then the type of structure we've been looking at is more like a butler building. It's almost like a prefab you put down. It's it's minimal um, disruption time because the concept for the farmer's market is this, you know, great open air, you know, tall ceilings with um, a community really gathering space as it adjoins Cathcart, so big open area. So I think it's achievable within um, the time frame, and I think that how, what is that period, um, you know, can the farmer's market locate, depending on how big that building is, on another portion of the lot expand into a couple of the streets while this structure is being put in place? I think, I think probably so. Um, but I think that the um, period for putting that down is certainly nowhere comparable to a, you know, ground up construction project like we're contemplating in some of the other areas. Great. And then last question. Um, so when we were on the subcommittee and we met with um, folks from Public Works, there was initially like a real urge to try to keep the 600 parking spaces as part of the project. That was then, you know, reduced to 400. It's now reduced to 243, I think it was. And I think earlier on, you know, the hope was that we could reduce it as great as possible. And there's a lot of pushback from city staff. And so I'm just kind of wondering why now um, is it coming down even further when back in when we were having these initial discussions, there's a lot of pushback for us to not reduce it past 600, let alone 400. Yeah, I, th I think the, the concern is still there that we're not providing enough supply even with this supply project. But I think the hope is that we can supply it um, in a financially sound way with, with the project that we have before us. Some of the changes are being steered by things like fire access for the alleyway um, and ensuring that we can maintain, you know, the, the footprint that we have for the commercial, the child care, and the library. I, I think if we could build a 600 space parking facility, it would be warranted from a supply and demand, but it may not be warranted from a project feasibility or from a, an aesthetic standpoint of like what we're trying to attempt to accomplish here. So I, I think the concern will continue to come up. You know, we, we continue to fund uh, transportation demand management programs, and we know that we need to get really aggressive with that regardless. Um, and, to, you know, this replacement parking is going to be meaningful for some of the existing 
uh, projects that are going up adjacent to it that aren't supplying parking on site. And we're going to have to consider some other long-term investments in other supply areas. Um, and that might mean being creative with doing things like um, automated systems within our existing facilities to expand capacity. You know, those are the, the options that we're looking at as we continue to, to look at that parking count. Um, and we're trying to hold it as best as possible. Um, we also um, initially looked at the pre-application and included an underground component to expand parking capacity, um, just so that we could flush out if there is any uh, challenges from the, from the planning department on that. And that is something that we might be able to consider as we do our financial modeling and bring it back to you for direction um, if, if we want to try to expand capacity beyond the 243 space. Thank you. That's helpful but just because um, trying to understand, you know, how there was like this urgency of like don't reduce it past 600 and now, you know, we're down, we're able to make it work with less. I think, you know, a lot of people appreciate, but uh, it was just really trying to get an understanding of kind of why um, there was that shift. So thank you. And just to, just to add to that, I mean, as we get further into design, I mean, I think the realities of the project on our overall objectives for the project really come into play. And so when you're balancing, oh, we can get, a, you know, a whole other floor of housing units here, that that's a priority that overweighs, at least I'm going to say from my perspective, you know, overall on the on the project, that doesn't mean as a city that we don't have a real need for parking. We do. But when you're looking at this envelope, I think there's decision points. And so Brian is sort of alluding to, we wanted to just technically see, you know, are there any building challenges? Are there any, you know, just, we all know the water table's really high in the downtown. Could you even consider going underground? You know, right now we're not proposing that, but that is something um, after you look at the updated parking numbers, I know that, you know, Claire and Public Works and Brian, they've all been sort of you know, meeting regularly to sort of look at the, as development goes forward in the downtown and, and new projects and more housing units are built, you know, that parking number and that deficit overall is increasing. So I, I think it's, it, you know, it's going to be a really important decision point, I think for you as, as a council to really look at and provide some direction to staff, ultimately what you want in this project, you know, what you want overall in the whole parking district downtown, because with the development, you know, that's proposed and in many cases already underway, as you're seeing, um, that really does change the future of parking and what we're providing downtown. So as it relates to this project, you know, we're making our best recommendations on the overall objectives and goals of what, you know, we really feel like we've been directed to include, but also feel like is the best for the project as we move forward. But there will definitely be decision points for you coming up. Great, thank you. And I would add, I would add one more thing. Um, Claire Gologli just presented a supply and demand update on the pipeline project to the downtown commission this month. And um, we can share that to the council members, that presentation, because it highlights, you know, the position of public works and the need we still believe is there. And I don't know that we're going to achieve, you know, satisfying all the replacement parking that's required with, with the new pipeline numbers up being updated. And so I think that would be beneficial uh, to pass along to the council members as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do any other council members have questions on this presentation? Council member Myers. Um, thank you for all the detail, um, uh, detail um, answers. Bonnie, I just want to make sure I understood um, just a little bit more on the so sort of where the farmer's market is. So my understanding is that um, lot seven potentially could be temporary, but it could be several years. Um, I would assume mostly because, it, you know, when we build the library over on lot four, that then gives us a planning period to work to look at what we could do over here on the existing library site. And I know at one point I think that that the farmers market did did sort of indicate that you know this is a one this would be a wonderful place for them to be because of that concept of being able to tie it into city hall and the civic and some of the other uses around here as well as, again, additional housing on this site. So when you say they may, they're kind of temporarily interested, but they may want the option. So during that period of that planning process that we would do for the existing library site, basically is where the farmer's market would re-engage at that period, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, you know, if things go forward and that opportunity site of the existing library is available, you know, the study that we did, oh gosh, I wanna say, the summer before last, you know, identified and ultimately council approved, you know, a uh, affordable housing, civic sort of commons 
potential farmers market for and other civic uses for the existing library site. So we would move forward on that process, but we could start some of that planning earlier than when the library is relocated to their new home, but we can't get too far ahead of that. Ultimately, the farmer's market on lot seven would be there at a minimum, I would say for five years, you know, because you have to both do the planning and then you have to build the new project and create the new home for them. So um, yeah, as a temporary, or I would guess more appropriately, an interim site would be lot seven with the option to either stay on lot seven or five, five to six years down the road, move to a new sort of civic center, you know, opportunity that would be built in and planned in the, you know, in the, you know, forthcoming next few years. And I don't want to obligate the, the city into the future too much, but I mean, with the number of housing units that are going to go up right around lot seven, um, you know, on other projects, you know, there's a, there's a built in, built in a buyer base right, right next door, literally. So people aren't going to need to drive to downtown. They're going to be living downtown <laughs> and they can walk right next door to the farmer's market. So I would imagine that gives them some really nice um, long-term, you know, opportunities to become a major, a major part of downtown, which is pr pretty exciting. That's right. And I, and, you know, I think also, when you look at two of those, uh, they're both private projects across the street from lot seven, you know, there's close to, I think, 400 units between those two projects that includes a largely market rate, but they include some inclusionary housing as well. You know, the um, one, the Southern project or the more Southern project of the two has a 60 foot public paseo that connects up to the river walk that also aligns with Cathcart street. So there's some real synergy there with what you can do in sort of public spaces and community gathering spaces that I think are going to be really exciting building, being able to maximize and work with um, some of the public elements and even some of our grant funding that we have for the public infrastructures that connects to the river walk. So I think there's some real opportunities ahead for creating some very vibrant public and community spaces that can really tie into the farmer's market. Thanks again for the update. Very exciting. Thank you. All right, it looks like that concludes questions from council. We will now um, move on to our next presentation. Thank you so much, Brian Borgino and Bonnie Lipscomb. We will now move on to agenda item seven, unified animal model ordinance update. And I'd like to welcome Erica Smart, interim general manager, Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us today. Um, my name is Erica Smart and as was just stated, I am the interim general manager at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter. And with me today is field services manager, officer Todd Stosi. Um, we're going to present to you the new Animal Services Unified Ordinance for your consideration, along with our agency's recommendation for it to be ultimately adopted by the city of Santa Cruz. Um, while I have not been a part of this process, as I've only been in this interim role since July, um, I know that for many years leading up to this moment, our prior shelter director, Melanie Sobel, as well as Officer Stosi, have been working tirelessly on the information that you're gonna learn today. Um, and I know that Officer Stosi has put a ton of work into this, so I'm really excited for him to get to share this with you. Um, his work on this project ultimately did get this ordinance uh, passed with our uh, Animal Services GPA Board, which consists of representatives from every jurisdiction in our county, as well as the County Board of Supervisors. Ultimately, this ordinance is important for our community as it does create a uniform and consistent regulatory enforcement and appeal process throughout the entire county. And this is going to result in less confusion and inefficiencies for both our animal control officers, shelter staff, and then of course the general public. Uh, currently, each jurisdiction does have its own separate code provisions for regulating animals and all these different ordinances for animal services and similarly situated um, jurisdictions just causes confusion. Um, and ultimately we're looking for consistency and uniformity throughout the county. So with that being said, thank you so much for your consideration on this matter. And I'm gonna turn it over to Officer Stosi, who's going to uh, share our presentation with you. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize that we couldn't be there in person today. Um, it was our intention. Um, I, I definitely like to uh, meet people in person and not do things over Zoom, but. I ended up going to work today and getting very sick, and so I'm at home right now. <laughs> so we ended up having to do it this way. Um, because I am at home, I don't have my normal um, county equipment that I have, so I am unable to bring up the presentation on my iPad. So I'm hoping, Bonnie, that you were able to 
uh, bring it up so that we can um, move it forward. Yes, one moment. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Um, so as Erica had mentioned, um, the uh, and I, I should backtrack a little bit. I've, I've been employed with the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter for the past 19 years, um, serving all the beautiful cities in our jurisdiction as well as the county. Um, it's unfortunate that I haven't met any of you uh, before today, um, but I have worked in your city for the past 19 years, um, regulating uh, animal ordinances, um, everything from bite investigations to cruelty and neglect to just basic leash law. Um, as Erica mentioned, um, the current ordinances throughout the county um, are very dramatically. Um, what happens in one jurisdiction is different in another jurisdiction. Um, some jurisdictions have, um, the animals have more rights. Um, in some jurisdictions, the humans have more rights, and it's just very confusing, um, you know, for those officers and for the public to um, have an understanding of, of where they stand and what we can actually do uh, to help protect the community as well as help protect uh, the neediest animals in our community. Um, so if you can advance the slide. Um, so as Erica did mention, um, we do have uh, juris our, our member jurisdictions. Um, we are JPA. Um, the, this model ordinance that we did um, put together over the past four or five years um, was ultimately approved by the County Board of Supervisors uh, in approximately January of this year, I believe. Um, we are now enforcing the model ordinance within uh, the County of Santa Cruz, and it has proven to be very effective, uh, particularly in our dangerous and potentially dangerous animal situations. It's much more streamlined, uh, provides um, our officers in the county much more um, streamlined um, requirements for animal owners to keep those animals as well as to keep the community safe. Um, our other jurisdictions uh, are the city of Capitola, um, city of Santa Cruz, city of Scotts Valley and city of Watsonville. And currently the um, ordinances in each one of those jurisdictions do vary very, very widely from each other. Um, in particular, the city of Watsonville is missing probably about 10 to 15 ordinances that all the other jurisdictions have. So if a dog kills a cat in the city of Watsonville, there actually is no crime against that under the current city of Watsonville law. Um, which is why we're hopefully going to be presenting to them in the near future. Uh, next, please. Um, again, and as mentioned, it does create a uniform and consistent regulatory enforcement and appeal process throughout the county. Um, currently, right now, if um, uh, prior to the um, ordinance passing in the county, um, if someone did appeal a, a dangerous or vicious dog case, it was heard in front of a, what was called the Nuisance Abatement Commission. Um, as part of creating this new model ordinance, we did dissolve the Nuisance Abatement Commission and anyone who appeals a vicious or dangerous dog case now or a vicious dangerous animal case um, hit, is heard by an independent hearing officer. And it's made it much easier to schedule those. It's made it uh, much less, um, uh, it, the, the previous the Nuisance Abatement Commission had 45 days to hold a hearing to get the five or six panel members together uh, sometimes resulting in dogs sitting in cages at the shelter for up to 45 days, which was not in the best interest of that animal. So now we can get these hearings held uh, pretty quickly, usually within uh, four or five days of the appeal process. Um, within the city of Santa Cruz right now, the appeal process is heard through the city manager's office, um, who does hire a independent hearing officer as well. Um, if we were able to, to pass this process within the city of Santa Cruz, um, we would be looking at basically using the same uh, hearing officers. Um, in the city of Capitola, those hearings are heard by the Capitola City Council, um, which is very confusing. And then in Scotts Valley and city of Watsonville, those hearings are heard by the chief of police. So it's, it's very, very different in each community. And this would really help st streamline that uh, throughout the county. Um, most importantly, again, I've been here 19 years and I still get confused by the uh, inefficiencies within the various ordinances. I still get confused when I'm standing in Watsonville, what I can do, um, when I'm standing in the city of Santa Cruz, what I can do. And this ordinance would really make it so that myself, other officers and new hires had a, had a true understanding um, of, of what we could enforce and the public would have that knowledge as well. Next. So for, the, for getting this passed within the county, obviously the county uh, has a very different demographic than the city of Santa Cruz. Um, we did a lot of outreach um, with a lot of farm uh, folks. 
Um, we, we met with the director of the Board of the California Rodeo several times. Um, we met with the Watsonville Fairgrounds uh, CEO and board on a number of occasions. Um, we also did meet with uh, Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors, um, both individually um, and then as a group. Um, and then we also met, uh, you know, we did a lot of public outreach. Uh, uh, you folks on, on the city, city of Santa Cruz board uh, probably don't know me very well, but I'm very uh, community oriented. Um, I'm very big into community policing. I'm very big into understanding what the community wants so that I know how to serve them. Um, and so in drafting this ordinance within the county and working with a lot of livestock, a lot of cows, horses, um, I, I live in Live Oak. I, I don't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a farm boy. And so I really wanted to understand what these laws I was creating uh, did to affect folks who, who had these animals. And so we met on a number of times with uh, the Farm Bureau, the Horsemen's Association, uh, the Livestock Association, 4-H Club, as well as FFA, um, and as well as a group called the Santa Cruz County Coalition of Family Farms and Homesteads. And through those community meetings and meeting with various people, we were able to change quite a few things we had in there, uh, getting an understanding of what it was the community wanted from us. Um, and, and one of um, our goals within the city of Santa Cruz is to do the same, uh, same with the other member jurisdictions, is to meet with the various demographics of each of the jurisdictions and find out what it is the community wants from us and how we can serve them and, and, and making sure that our ordinances don't misalign with some basic, um, uh, you know, things that people want in that community. Next. So some of the main general provisions that we did change within the uh, county um, is under chapter 6.04, which is the general provisions. Uh, one of the big things we wanted to add was interference with an animal control officer in the performance of their duties. Um, animal control officers are kind of a weird hybrid of law enforcement. Um, under California code, we do have all the rights of a peace officer while we are working. Uh, we, can, we do have the power of arrest and we do have the power to write and serve search warrants. Um, however, uh, under, under penal code 148, which is um, resisting arrest, we have found that sometimes the DA will prosecute that and sometimes the DA will not because of um, our weird hybrid status that we have. So we felt it important to add this provision in there so that our officers are, are safe. Um, our officers do go out and on a daily basis, interact with a lot of the community um, and, and our officers are not armed. Um, you know, we, again, we do have the power of arrest and the power of writing citations, um, but we don't uh, have the full protections of, of most peace officers. So we wanted to make sure that we were protected if, if we did come into some um, situation which does happen out there. Um, we added in staking out or tying out an animal. Um, this under California state law, there is a provision um, in regards to tethering animals, making it illegal. Um, that particular law was written into state law because of a health and safety issue um, in regards to uh, uh, animals, who, particularly male uh, intact animals who are tied up are more prone to bite. Um, the particular particular code was written after a young boy was killed uh, down in Southern California by a family dog that was tethered and intact. Um, so the law really focuses more on um, the safety of humans, which, which is great. Um, but we wanted to make sure that the safety of the animals was also uh, tied into our ordinance. So we added general provisions in there that if you are gonna use a trolley system uh, or a runner system, which is legal, under California law that that animal be put on a harness as opposed to a collar. Um, in, in my career doing this, um, I've seen many animals that have choked themselves out, uh, have died, um, have not been able to get water appropriately. So we added quite a few provisions in the county code that just strengthen uh, the state health and safety code to protect animals. Um, we did add a provision about keeping animals with communicable diseases. Um, particularly now, we are definitely seeing a very high uptick of avian influenza. Uh, particularly in the Bay Area, Santa Cruz has just been um, added to that list. Uh, the, the waterfowl population, uh, geese, uh, and I don't know if you're aware of this, but up at the, um, uh, the lake, and I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the lake, but it's up off of High Street um, in the city of Santa Cruz on the Upper West Side. Uh, we did work closely with Fish and Wildlife recently regarding goose with avian influenza. Um, and now that that is in our community, we want to make sure that if, if that particular disease or other diseases start infecting uh, the animal population that we can regulate it so that those animals don't continue to infect uh, other animals. Um, 
And with avian influenza, it is very um, communicable to chickens, um, which raises a, an, an alarming red flag with the number of uh, backyard chickens uh, that are particularly in the city of Santa Cruz, making sure that uh, we don't you know, spread a disease if we don't have to. Um, we also added a section about maintenance of fowl, goats, rabbits, and guinea pigs. Uh, currently, under all the city and county ordinances, there really is no regulation on, on how to maintain those animals. And so we wanted to put something together that people who decided to have a backyard flock of chickens or wanted to get a goat, uh, wanted to have a rabbit or a guinea pig, knew exactly what they needed to do to care for that animal. Um, knew what those animals, understand what those animals' needs are um, so that the animals uh, do get the proper care um, when they are put in people's backyards or in people's homes. Um, and then we did also add spaying or neutering, neutering of adopted animals. Uh, to ensure that any animal that's adopted out um, by any organization within the county uh, does have to spare and neuter them to keep down uh, the companion animal overpopulation crisis. Um, as you may or may not be aware, we are the um, county's only open door admission shelter, which means we take in any animal day or night, no questions asked, um, which does unfortunately mean we do have to euthanize some animals uh, for, for sickness, for, for aggression, um, and by making sure that any organization out there is adopting out animals, that they're spaying or neutering them is gonna help us alleviate that problem. Next. Um, as far as licensing goes, we did uh, currently in, the, uh, in all jurisdictions, dogs are required to be licensed um, through our, our, our agency. Um, but we decided to um, really look at, at expanding that. And, and a big one for me, um, I've been involved in a number of cockfighting cases in my career, um, taking down a lot of folks. Um, I currently know where a lot of people are breeding um, fighting roosters for, for cockfighting, um, but the cockfighters have gotten very smart <laughs> over the years and they've learned not to keep their paraphernalia with their fighting cocks. So if we get a search warrant now, a lot of these large facilities um, we're not going to find anything but roosters, which is not uh, a crime in the state of California. Um, so to try and help us with that, we decided to add a licensing section for folks who have um, a certain number of roosters per acre. Um, it, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, you can have two roosters on a half an acre property, uh, four roosters on an acre property, and then it kind of, kind of moves up and allows a maximum of 10 roosters. When we originally started this particular section, it was called the Rooster Facility License. Um, and, in he, and in speaking with all the community groups we met with, they really wanted to understand why we were targeting roosters. And in, and in talking to them about cockfighting, um, we got the understanding that just banning roosters wasn't the way to go. Um, that a lot of people who do have roosters in their flocks are not fighting those birds, that they're there um, you know, to fertilize the eggs. And so we added the facility license and changed it to male old english game game male game bird or male game cock, cock facility um, that way we would target the specific breeds that were being utilized in cockfighting um, and and within the city of santa cruz there are um, there, there are definitely cockfighting cockfighting happening um, i don't think a lot of people are aware of it most people think it's it's in different sections of the county but it does occur uh, within the city as well um, we also added under licensing non-commercial rabbits to the microchip section. Uh, currently under all the member jurisdictions besides the, the city of Scotts Valley, um, all dogs and cats are required to be microchipped. And the advantage of this is really getting animals home quicker. Um, all of our officers carry microchip scanners in their vehicles. When they scan an animal and has a microchip, we run that microchip. And if we have an owner attached to it, we drive that animal home. The animal number never comes to the shelter. Um, and we felt that getting rabbits microchipped because rabbit, rabbits are actually a very um, um, highly, owned, highly owned pet within the county of Santa Cruz um, and, and our member jurisdictions. Um, and we do pick up rabbits stray quite frequently. Getting them microchipped would get them home a lot quicker as well. Um, the reason you see the word non-commercial rabbits there is in speaking with a lot of the farm groups, um, there's, there's a rabbit breeder down in um, uh, the Watsonville area, the county section of Watsonville, who does breed rabbits for consumption. Um, and he felt that he did not want to have to, to microchip all of his rabbits if he was breeding for consumption. Um, and so we agreed with that and said, you know, this, this truly is an ordinance that we're creating to get pet rabbits home. And so we'll add that term non-commercial to it. Um, in addition to the county code chapter 6.10, um, we did amend um, 
mandatory spay neutering for non-commercial rabbits. Again, the same thing there, which is adding non-commercial to make sure that um, pet rabbits are spayed and neutered. Um, and then we did what we found to be very important um, is adding a requirement on the care for all cats. Um, there is a big movement within the state of California right now that um, a lot of animal shelters are one, no longer accepting cats. Um, because state law does not require them to take in cats, they're just turning cats away. Um, we as an open door admission shelter um, believe in the philosophy that all animals are equal and so we still take in cats. Um, in addition, what's happening in a lot of places in California is agencies are doing what they're calling feral freedom, um, where they're taking an animal, taking cats, um, feral cats, domestic cats, um, any cat they can get their hands on, spaying and neutering them, and then just putting them back where they found them. Um, and we don't feel that's right. We feel that that is abandonment under state law. Um, we feel that you know cats should have the same uh, protections as dogs. And so if someone wants to start a feral, feral cat colony, we are not opposed to that. We actually would, would encourage people um, to have a feral cat colony. Um, but with that, there are some responsibilities that come with it. Um, if that cat does get sick or injured, um, the person should be required to take that animal to get vet care. Um, you know, if that animal gets feline leukemia, it's probably in the best interest that that animal then be moved indoors for the rest of its life and or be euthanized um, due to the severity of, of the spread of that disease to other animals in the community. Um, so we found it very important to, um, to add that clause. Um, in, in my career here in Santa Cruz, I've seen a lot of people who do TNR that don't have any requirements. Um, and they call us, say there's a sick or injured cat in their backyard. When we get there, they say, oh, yeah, I've been feeding that cat for five years, but now it's your problem. Um, and then the county or the city is responsible for paying uh, for the care of that cat or the euthanasia of that cat as opposed to the person who's been caring for them. Um, so, so we just found that very important to put that one in. Next. Um, we strengthened our animal control, what, what our officers can do. Um, again, this is that tethering dog section I'd mentioned earlier. Um, the safety requirements for animals in parked motor vehicles. Uh, currently under state law, it's an infraction. Um, it's also an infraction in, in all the member jurisdictions. Um, but we wanted to, to strengthen that up a little bit about what is legal, what is illegal for an animal to park a motor vehicle. Um, the unfortunate thing is a lot of people think just having an animal in a vehicle is illegal. Um, we're lucky in the city of Santa Cruz um, that it normally doesn't get to extremely, the weather doesn't get to extreme here. And so oftentimes if an animal is in a vehicle and it's parked in shade and the windows are somewhat rolled on, down, that animal is safe. Um, however, we do have some of these, these heat waves that are happening and we do have people who don't park in the shade. Um, and, and in my career, I've definitely had to break a few animals out of vehicles, uh, particularly at the boardwalk uh, down in their parking area. Um, we definitely have to break a lot of animals out of there during the summer. So we wanted to make sure that, that there was more uh, requirements in there that, that we could enforce. Uh, dead animals in public places uh, might sound like a silly one, but there's precedent for it. Um, there's definitely been people who have kept dead animals longer than they should have, have definitely kept them in public places longer than they should have. And uh, we wanted to make sure that, um, you know, if someone's animal was deceased, that it was moved uh, fairly quickly to... Uh, either burial, cremation, or or what, what they were going to do with that body. Um, as far as animal control officers present at rodeos and similar events, um, that currently is in the county code. We did not touch that particular code. Um, in speaking with the um, attorney for the California Rodeo Association, um, he actually liked the code the way it stood and liked having animal control officers there, uh, liked the transparency of us being there and didn't want that change. So we kept that in there uh, based on his feedback. Um, I don't believe the city of Santa Cruz has rodeos, um, but if they do in the future, um, we would like to be present at them just to make sure that if animals do get injured, they do get the vet care as required. Uh, currently, there really is no law about poisoning animals. Um, we get a lot of, of neighbor disputes where people um, will poison meat, throw it over the, over the fence uh, to, the neighbor's, to the neighbor's animal, usually based on a barking complaint. Um, and so we wanted to strengthen that, that it is, um, you know, poisoning an animal um, is illegal. Um, as well as on that, there actually is no law that giving um, any sort of drug, uh, whether it be marijuana, methamphetamine, um, alcohol to an animal is illegal. Um, so in the county ordinance, we did add that as well, um, that you cannot um, intentionally uh, provide, um, you know, cannabis, alcohol, methamphetamine, what have you to an animal. Um, we do see some unintentional people, people's animals um, ingesting edibles. 
uh, marijuana edibles, but that would not be subject to to this particular ordinance. You know, non-intentional um, it is not illegal. Um, we definitely speak with those people when that happens and ask them to store their um, their edibles in a different location um, so that their animals can't get to it. Um, but but mainly that part of the law really is more intent. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, um, but about a year ago, uh, we did have a houseless person uh, living down in the bench lands that did um, possibly feed methamphetamine to a wild hawk. Um, and uh, we weren't able to prove it at the time that it was intentional, um, but this would um, you know, further strengthen us in being able to enforce it if we could have. Um, additionally, we did add injuring wildlife um, in here in, into the ordinance in the county. Um, and again, this was, we met with a, a hunt, hunting group in regards to this, and we did put the caveat that anything that's legal under fish and wildlife codes uh, in the state of California, it's not illegal. It's not illegal to hunt. It's not illegal to fish. Um, as long as you have the proper um, licensing for that, uh, we just don't want people going out there and, and um, injuring raccoons or possums because they see them as a nuisance, um, which does happen. And so we want to prevent that from happening. Um, as mentioned, uh, we do have that new restriction on the Old English game, male game bird or male game cocks. And then as far as the, the more enforceable excessive animal noise uh, section, uh, currently the way the law reads is, is really is, is, is open to interpretation. What, what, is, what would um, challenge the reasonable sensibilities of a person um, regarding animal noise? And so we, we strengthened it up a little bit. Uh, we no longer allow for anonymous noise complaints. Um, we definitely found that a lot of times our agency was used in neighbor disputes. Um, even though the animal wasn't being noisy, we were called in to, to, to deal with it. Um, so now we do have a section where if people want to make a noisy animal complaint, they do need to sign something, um, an affidavit um, on a penalty of perjury um, that the noise is occurring. Um, and when they do that, we will then go in person and meet with the animal owner. What I have found in my career is about 90% of animal noise violations are because the animal is bored, um, which in my mind is a, is a, is a low-level form of animal neglect, um, not an illegal form of animal neglect, but something that we can quickly change by providing resources and information. Um, all of our officers carry Kongs um, and other dog enrichment um, uh, tools within their vehicles. And so when we do these noisy animal complaints now, and we meet with someone whose dog has separation anxiety or is barking in the backyard because it's bored, we provide them with enrichment activities and that dog now has a much better life. Um, previously, uh, we would a lot of times just, um, under the old ordinance, would just mail postcards for the first two complaints um, and wouldn't visit uh, until the third complaint. So this is really helping cut down on neighborhood dis or neighbor disputes as well as helping out those animals much quicker as, as well as resolving actual noise complaints. Um, and from what I've seen um, since this ordinance has been in effect for um, about nine months, um, the, the community is much happier with it. The community is much happier with an actual presence of an officer response. The fact that we're actually solving the problem uh, much quicker by providing that enrichment activity. Um, so it's a win-win for both the community um, as well as for the animals involved. Next. As far as wild and dangerous animals, um, we did want to add a section about uh, feeding, sale, and release of waterfowl and pigeons. Um, there is, it's, it's not an epidemic, <laughs> uh, to say the least, but there are people who do release pigeons and waterfowl and, and do feed them, and that really um, can mess with the natural ecosystem and the natural um, uh, animals that are out there living in the wild. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't happening. Um, so that our wild creatures didn't have their natural environments um, overtaken by domestic animals being released. Uh, the wild rodents and vermin, um, we definitely wanted to make sure that people were prohibited, prohibited from feeding wild rodents and vermin, uh, just for the safety aspect of it, just for uh, the, the health and safety aspect of it. Um, I'm sure you're aware, um, I've been down to the bench lands many a times over the past few years, um, and the wild rodent population down there is, is out of control. Um, and it's because people are, are allowed to, to feed rodents. People are allowed to leave things out that they can eat. This would help combat that, would help combat that in neighborhoods, um, in areas where the houseless are living, um, and it would really help uh, cut down on any sort of communicable diseases that could come from the wild rodent population. Um, Punta virus is real. Um, we've definitely had a few staff members catch it. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that um, that zoonotic disease is not affecting the members of our community. 
And then chapter 6.19 is definitely uh, the ordinance that all of our jurisdictions needed the most, uh, the regulation of dangerous animals. Um, we were able to mirror state law quite well in uh, changing it from in the, in the past and currently the way it reads in the city of Santa Cruz is a vicious animal is any animal that barks, yelps, howls, chases, threatens to chase or harasses a human. Um, so my little dog, who's a rat terrier, who occasionally will chase uh, someone who comes into my office, she could be deemed vicious under, under the city of Santa Cruz code, as well as all the other codes uh, besides the county now. Um, and that discrepancy led to a lot of animals being deemed vicious who truly weren't vicious. Um, you know, I take liability very seriously and the way the law is written very seriously. Um, and there wasn't a lot of the, the you know, it was, it was a very broad um, ordinance. Um, so there was a lot of animals that were deemed vicious who truly weren't vicious, but I wanted to make sure our agency and, and our member jurisdictions weren't held liable if that animal did something in the future. So the new regulation of dangerous animals uh, does, does have a, a couple tiered system. Uh, we now have potentially dangerous animal um, or a vicious animal. And it's not specifically just dogs. Um, I've, I've deemed a few cats vicious in my career. I've also deemed a donkey vicious in my career. Um, so there are other animals out there besides dogs that are attacking people. Um, so by providing the potentially dangerous and vicious, we truly are going after animals that do pose a public safety risk. And in addition to defining more, um, much less open to interpretation and more um, black and white in regards to uh, potentially dangerous and vicious, we also added a very long section of what animals or what owners who own those animals are required to do um, in regard, you know, one of those is they have to have the animal wearing a basket muzzle, if it's a dog wearing a basket muzzle while off property at any time. Uh, this will prevent any future bites that occur because the basket muzzle is on, um, while at the same time the basket muzzle does allow the animal to eat, drink, uh, and breathe normally. Um, so while a dog wearing a basket muzzle may look a little bit like uh, Hannibal Lecter, um, it's actually safer for the community to have that dog like that. Um, so if it does break free from its human, it can't bite again. Um, we also added a liability section to that. So people who do keep a potentially dangerous or vicious dog do have to have a, a certain liability amount um, on their home or renter's insurance um, to ensure that, um, you know, if the dog does do something again, that the victim is compensated. Um, there are other uh, additions to that, uh, including fence inspections that our officers go do. Um, sometimes having to pour concrete around fences so dogs can't dig out or building, you know, 10 foot fences so they can't jump out. Um, but it really makes it much more uh, streamlined for animal owners and the community to know what uh, those folks are responsible for. Um, and this does include the, the houseless folks as well. Um, there are a few dogs that have been deemed uh, dangerous um, or potentially dangerous within the city of Santa Cruz. Or actually, I should back that up and say vicious within the city of Santa Cruz that currently uh, do live in the benchlands and do live in, in the Poganip area. And on the old ordinance, when they're deemed vicious, there's really not much we can do except say, hey, your dog's vicious. If it violates again, we, we may have to destroy it. Um, this new code, if, if adopted in the city of Santa Cruz, would also ensure that the houseless community was safe um, so that they're not being uh, exposed to animals um, that could attack them um, wherever they're living. Next. The administrative appeal section, um, this was a big one for us because the Nuisance Abatement Commission, um, while I enjoyed my time working with them, was very difficult to um, have, have all the members come forward. Um, as mentioned, sometimes animals would sit in cages for up to 45 days while we tried to convene. Um, so the new administrative appeal section um, really makes it um, so that we know exactly what it is we're doing. Um, if someone appeals a mandatory spay neuter, we know how it appeals. If someone appeals impound fee, we know how to how it's appealed. Um, if someone you know appeals a, a dangerous dog or a vicious dog case, we know how it's appealed. Um, it's 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 very just straightforward, um, and it also does address the cost for administrative appeals. Um, previously, you know, or you know, if if we have to hire an outside attorney in in some of the jurisdictions, you know, we're responsible for paying that fee. This now puts the onus on the person who's appealing it um, to, to be responsible for those fees. Um, if they do win their appeal, then they do get their, they are, they do get refunded their money um, so that uh, everything is fair for everyone. Next. So 
I know you haven't seen the county ordinance as approved. Um, I'm happy to send that out. It's also happy to, um, you know, meet with any groups that you may feel necessary that we meet with um, within the city of Santa Cruz uh, to understand what it is the community is looking for. Um, but we really hope um, that the Santa Cruz City Council will consider um, what we're talking about and, and ultimately um, and I know it takes time, um, approve the unifi unified, I'm sorry, united animal ordinance so that we have that uniform and consistent regulatory enforcement and appeal process throughout the entire county. Next, I think that's it. Are there any questions? First, thank you so much, Officer Stussy. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, th that was really informative and um, thank you for the presentation. And uh, before I go to questions, um, I think uh, Laura Schmidt here also would like to add. Thank you, Mayor. And I want to thank Erica and um, Todd as well for the details around the content of the potential model animal ordinance that we would adopt. As far as next steps for the city of Santa Cruz, as a member of the JPA, what would now happen is we would work, the city manager's office would work with the city attorney's office to reconcile our ordinances with the model and um, try to figure out how we could fall into the model and then bring back to the community any issues that we thought we would need to have community conversations around and then eventually back to council for adoption of the changes. So those would be the next steps. So just wanted to put that forth. You will have more detailed opportunities to talk about various aspects of the ordinance. So we don't necessarily need to do that today for this presentation item because you can't obviously um, take action on it at this point. But it is a project for the city manager's office to move forward with the animal shelter and the city attorney's office. Thank you for clarifying that. That was definitely one of my questions. Do you have a projected or estimated timeline for that process? We do not. I know the animal shelter board would like us to move forward as quickly as possible, but we also have the other agencies that need to move this forward as well. So um, it is not an easy task. I already had somebody in the city attorney's office a little bit ago do a reconciliation, and it is quite significant, the changes to our existing ordinances, so it, it will take some time. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions from council members at this time on this presentation? Uh, this is agenda item seven, unified animal model ordinance update. Oh, council member Cummings. I'll just say a quick comment and just thank you for the presentation and for the work that you all are doing to try to bring alignment around all these um, policies at the, at the county level, but you know, incorporating the cities into that. And so just wanna express my appreciation about that. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. And we have uh, Council Member Myers. Yeah, I just also wanted to say thank you, um, especially around the details around um, some of the, the dangerous animal uh, items and some of the things you put in place. I recently had some experience with that in our neighborhood and it was, it was a great process. It was very clear and, um, you know, it really helps people really understand, um, you know, how to keep, how, how to keep certain animals, you know, safe, but, you know, away from animals that they may harm. So thank you for your work and uh, on improving thank everything. Thank you so much. That concludes our questions. And thank you again. I will move on now to agenda item number eight. This is a presentation of Fire Prevention Week. And we have uh, our Fire Chief Rob Odie present. Welcome. Hi, Mayor Brenner, Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. It's nice to be in front of all of you in person today. Obviously, for an important issue, as well as wanted to just bring up some upcoming events that will be critical for the community as well. And um, I believe Bonnie has my presentation. So uh, this week, or I'm sorry, this year, um, Fire Prevention Week falls on uh, the week of October 9th through the 15th. Next slide. Um, I want to discuss with you sort of the important theme that they have identified for this year, um, as well as remind everybody about some fire prevention practices and overall emergency preparedness. Next slide. 
Um, like I mentioned, Fire Prevention Week uh, runs from Sunday, October 9th through Saturday the 15th. And um, as I get into the history of Fire, Fire Prevention Week, we'll discuss why October 9th is so important. Go ahead. Um, so the history of Fire Prevention Week, um, again, marks the Great Chicago Fire uh, that occurred in 1871. Um, started October 8th, and actually um, most of it occurred on October 9th and actually was fully extinguished on October 10th. Since 1922, uh, the National Fire Protection Agency, otherwise known as the NFPA, has sponsored this public observance. And it was actually instituted, um, uh, formalized in 1925 by President uh, Calvin Coolidge, which actually turns out to be one of the longest running public health observances in the US. The goal, obviously, is to remind and educate the public, adults, children, and teachers alike, on how to stay safe in case of a fire. Um, again, observed every single year during the week of October 9th in comm commemoration of the Great Chicago Fire. I think it's important to note um, this particular fire burned 3.3 square miles of the city of Chicago, destroyed 17,000 structures, uh, 300 people died, and it left 100,000 people homeless. So a lot of lessons learned, again, which is why we have Fire Prevention Week, and it's so important to remind the public of what the themes are and how they can stay safe in case of a fire. So again, 100 years um, as of this year for Fire Prevention Week. Next slide. This year's theme um, is no coincidence. Um, it, it revolves around um, plan your escape, and particularly in your, your homes where, where you reside and spend the majority of your time with your family. Um, the theme is uh, fire won't wait, so plan your escape. Um, obviously, the NFPA has a bunch of different uh, materials on their website for teachers and community members. Um, to help send this message, and they have it both English and Spanish. Um, next slide. Um, some of the big takeaways from this fire won't wait, plan your escape, is um, quite simple. It's draw a map of your home. Um, visit every room and have two ways out. For those that have um, second story bedrooms, it's important to have some sort of ladder um, for children or other members of your family to get out. It's important to um, walk outside, walk inside your home, and plan for your abilities um, for every family member in your home. You want to decide on a meeting place, and you also want to have a communication plan for that family. Um, you want to practice this two times a year. Um, so again, uh, protect your loved ones. Have a, a plan. I think it's important. Um, I, I'll admit this in public. Last night, I set off my fire alarm in my home while cooking. And my daughter, obviously not knowing exactly what the fire alarm was, being a two-year-old, I used it as an opportunity to you know, educate. So it was get down, get low, get out. And we actually practiced in our home uh, as, as recent as last night. So again, very <laughs> critical. And they're never too young to start um, practicing these, these uh, safety measures. Um, let's see. Next slide. Well, again, two ways out of your room. Clear paths so we don't want to be hoarders. We want to make sure we can get out in the dark. Have that common meeting place, and of course, practice twice a year. Next slide. And uh, of course, on the NFPA.org website, they have this little checklist that is very user friendly for um, everyone in the public. We can also print these out, and people can come pick them up at Fire Admin. Next slide. And um, as a, again, sort of a coincidence, but um, something that I think is very appropriate given the time of year we find ourselves in with fire season, um, we'd like to also draw attention to our own emergency preparedness flyer that the fire department prepared a few years ago. Next slide. It's a four-page flyer. Um, it's actually sort of interactive. Um, acting Fire Marshal Tim Shields um, is sort of modeling it here. But again, this is something we want everyone to have on the refrigerator, in every vehicle, in their go bag. And again, it's sort of an interactive tool for people to check boxes and make sure they're prepared. And it's not just for fires, not just for wildland fires, but earthquakes, tsunamis, floods. So we have a variety of different um, sections. If you want to go to the next slide, um, it sort of highlights in the case of flood, tsunami, fire. Um, so again, there's some nuances to each emergency, and we just want to make sure everyone's educated and prepared for each one of those emergencies. And most recently, next slide, we were able to successfully translate our flyer into Spanish um, for that part of our community. And we're hoping to, we just had them all printed out and hoping to set some outreach events in the near future to work with uh, the community on you know, making sure that they are too prepared um, for an emergency. Next slide. 
This is just the fourth page of the uh, Spanish version. Again, there's a map on there that highlights um, the various routes in and out of the city, um, and also some emer some radio stations, TV um, outlets that also will um, you know, potentially have emergency communication for the public. Next slide. Um, some other things for emergency preparedness, we want to make sure people, um, you know, become familiar and connected in their respective communities. So you can join a community emergency response team, otherwise known as CERT. Um, join a FireWise group. Um, there's a number of them developed or currently being developed in the city. The two of the most well-established are in Prospect Heights and in Highland um, neighborhood on the Upper West Side. Um, you can sign up. Um, you can go to our website or you can go to um, NETCOM, our dispatch center's website, and sign up for Code Red, which is basically your reverse 911 service that would advise you if there was an evacuation and, and what instructions you would need to follow. Again, develop an evacuation plan. Develop a family communication plan, so single point of contact. The recommendation is to always have someone identified outside of the city of Santa Cruz, potentially out of state, where everyone could sort of, that they would be independent of whatever emergency was occurring here that you could uh, communicate with and make sure everybody is, uh, reports that they are safe. Um, evaluate your home and property for hazards. And um, also a big importance is making sure you know where utilities are. Your water shut off, your gas, your electrical meter. So if you do have an issue, you can promptly shut those off and remain safe. And last but not least, create a go bag for your home, your office, have it in each car that you have. Make sure you have all those critical items um, like uh, medications, documents, food, water for at least three days, some clothing, an AM, FM radio. Um, one thing that we point out in our flyer is the six Ps. So personal computers or phones, plastic, meaning credit cards, um, people, pets, and all the associated needs for those people and pets, important phone numbers, prescriptions, and of course, any important photos. So have all those things in one common place so you're ready to go and have them with your go bag. Next slide. Um, here is a link and again, just a um, sort of advertisement, if you will, for the Code Red mobile alert app. That's OK. <laughs> and this next slide, and that again is um, the current provider that we are using for the reverse 911. Um, and again, that is um, conducted um, through our dispatch center up at Netcom. Next slide. And the last thing I want to draw the attention to is, again, through partnerships with other uh, various community groups, um, the FireWise groups within the city of Santa Cruz are planning a um, National Fire Awareness Day. It's going to be um, uh, an event on the Upper West Side on Sunday, October 9th um, at 12 o'clock to, to, until 4.30 p.m. It's going to be at the High Street Community Church, 850 High Street. Um, again, a joint effort between the Prospect Height and Highland FireWise groups. For more information, um, it's hard to read on this flyer, but you can go to highlandfirewise.org. And again, it's just an effort to get the community together, to get them prepared, and they want to enhance emergency communication and wildfire preparedness in their respective communities. And we'll be there as well with the fire engine and handing out some various information and, of course, um, interacting and answering any questions that the community may have. I think that was the last slide. And then, of course, one other important thing I wanted to draw your attention to is um, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And so you'll be seeing your uh, local firefighters wearing these shirts in lieu of their Class B uniform shirts. And again, just to raise awareness about breast cancer and all other cancers. Um, and we also are selling those um, at our fire stations and at admin, um, $20. And the proceeds go to breast cancer um, research. So again, just wanted to make everybody aware of that as we approach the beginning of October. And that concludes my presentation. Of course, I'll answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. And also, thank you so much to Tim Shields for <laughs> providing um, the demonstrations. Um, I do have a question um, on the emergency preparedness flyers. Um, I think, like, I have a a stack of those that I keep uh, and provide to um, businesses downtown. So um, even though it's, it talks about, and you mentioned evacuation plans for your home and your family, I really try to encourage businesses. We spend a lot of time at work, and a lot of times people at work don't know where gas shut off or who's in charge of that, who to call, what to do, where to go and creating a plan that you can keep posted 
and that sheet is so handy. I've given it out so many times and people really appreciate that because everything is there for, you, for someone to fill in. So it's a really helpful tool and I encourage uh, anybody in the public if they wanna pick one up. I think they're also available at the library and at your fire station one and online. Yep. There's many correct. ways to get that sheet. Do you have anything to add, anything else to add for uh, workplaces and evacuation plans, emergency preparedness, things like that? No, I wanted to say that I, I appreciate you bringing that up because as you know, we spend a lot of our time at work. And of course, during the 89 earthquake, there were a tremendous amount of people during those hours of the day that were down here at work and were affected. Um, some negatively because of that natural disaster. And so having this awareness and having this document there, and again, we encourage everyone to take a stack because they're working documents that change. We change email addresses, our personal and business addresses, phone numbers and so forth, and contact information for our loved ones. And so um, we encourage people to come by our fire admin. They can go to the website and print them out as well. Um, but again, the more the merrier. And, and uh, we always wanna get that message out so that people, the other motto is don't be scared, get prepared. And so that's both in the home and in the workplace. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Yeah, we, great, thank you so much. Other questions? Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, okay, we have Vice Mayor Watkins, Council Member Myers. I don't, ha I don't have a question, but I just wanna say thank you. And I was up in De La Viega Park and I, you can really see it. And then most recently there's the Firewise sign that's up there. And I just really appreciate you being so receptive to working with the neighbors, being kind of CC'd on some of the communication. It just really builds the relationship we need to have with our neighborhoods to, for our mutual safety. Um, so thank you for the presentation, and I will stop by to get a shirt. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Myers. I just want to give a shout out to um, Tim, um, the fire marshal, um, not just for your modeling of the uh, merchandise, um, but you met with um, the Firewise group from Poganip a couple of months ago. And I see a lot of those folks when I walk in Poganip um, in the mornings. And uh, anyways, they're just thrilled and very, very thankful also for the departments, really the efforts to get um, additional funding for these, these community efforts. So. Um, they're just thrilled with what the department is doing and they feel a lot of partnership and so thank you for doing that work. It's well appreciated. Absolutely. We find that we're most successful when we have those partnerships with the community. So we look forward to continuing those efforts in the future. I think you should make a model like a big dollar sign next time. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Are there any other questions? Okay, comments or questions? Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thanks. And thanks for the presentation. I I do have one question. I've heard this come up a number of times in the community, but um, just, you know, given the fires that we experienced back in 2020, some folks are concerned with like, you know, what if there's another major catastrophic fire? Like, what is our plan in terms of how people should, you know, get out and like escape, you know, uh, evacuation routes, things like that. And like, what's the, kind of the city's plan, you know, if that were to occur. And so I'm wondering, is there any kind of centralized location on the city's website for fire where, people can get information on like what um, those plans would be? That's a great question, council member, and I appreciate you bringing it up because we are currently working on finalizing a finished product or platform, if you will. It's called Zone Haven. We sort of beta tested it during CZU, ironed out a lot of the different kinks that we have, particularly locally. And a lot of it we, we learned, especially being that the Valley was had a lot of remote locations and kind of one way in, one way, in, one way out. And so we have since worked on finalizing our maps and we've up uploaded them to this server, <clears throat> this platform. It's called Zone Haven. There's two portals. There's the uh, first responder portal, which is Zone Haven EVAC, and then there's the, the public side, which is Zone Haven Aware. And so as we work on uploading and finalizing those maps, and then actually, I think it's tomorrow or Thursday, we're doing some training with PD to make sure that all of our command staff, respectively, are prepared on how to use and execute this platform. And then once we get there, we'll do a sort of a, a PR campaign to get this out to the public so they're aware of the product. And of course, that will be located on our site. And then we'll do some other measures to make sure that everybody's well informed. And that includes some community outreach events as well. So Great. thank Looking you for the question. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I was jotting down all the websites so that we can get that information out. Um, I've reached out to you, Chief Odie, been meeting with some FireWise leaders throughout the city, and um, 
thank you for offering to join the meeting that we have this week. There is a real big interest in understanding what the evacuation plans and communication plans are um, and partnering with the county to do uh, beyond the fire prevention week at town hall meeting where there's an opportunity for folks to do some Q&A. So thank you for your work. Thank you for um, your partnership. And I'm, I'm looking forward to working with you on this. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity. And again, many of those websites on our um, department website. And again, we just look forward, we can always do better when, when serving the community. And so we look forward to having those meetings, having those events so that we can just make sure that we're meeting the expectations and the needs of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will now move on with our agenda today. I have a few announcements. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are here in person on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption. And we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside of chambers. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or a feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually, call in at the beginning of the item you are wishing to comment on using the instructions on the screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please remember there may be a delay in streaming so that if you continue to speak on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your time for public comment, please raise your hand by either dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. Please note public comment is only heard on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers 11 through 22 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none, thank you. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask the city attorney to report on our closed session this morning. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Brunner, members of the city council. Council met uh, in closed session commencing at noon today to discuss the following items. Item one was a conference with labor negotiators uh, council met with its negotiators involving the SEIU temporary employees, SEIU service employees, and supervisors, OE3. Item two was a public employee performance evaluation involving the city manager and the city attorney. Item three was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims, the claims of Jose uh, A. Talamantes Haro, and Seraphine G. Ruiz. Um, those items are also listed as uh, number 12 on your consent agenda this afternoon. Item four was a conference with legal counsel involving anticipated litigation, uh, significant exposure to litigation. Counsel received a report from the city attorney's office uh, and gave direction on that item. Item five was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation, case entitled City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California et al. Currently pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Council received a report from and gave direction from uh, to the city attorney's office on that matter, and there was no reportable action. Thank you. At this time in the agenda, item nine. I'll call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to agenda item 10, 
This is the time for council members to report out on actions at external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings that we've attended. For future meetings, please come prepared and provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since last council meeting so that the council and the public can be informed. And I will start to my right with council member Golder. Um, yesterday, council member Cummings and vice mayor Watkins and I met for a public safety meeting and we um, discussed the is it the independent auditor? No, it was the, it was the um, use, of use of force. Thank you, the use of force report. And um, we also decided to have an additional meeting in before the end of the year in November, I believe the 30th. And we, um, at that time, want to set a schedule for next year's meetings and kind of talk about what um, the scope of that committee will look like moving forward. Previously, it would only meet annually to discuss the independent police auditor's report, and we feel like there's a lot of public safety issues that need to be addressed, and it's a good way um, to maybe bring things to council through, um, through that conduit. So that was pretty much all we discussed, and it was a pretty brief meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Does that conclude your report? Thank you. Uh, council Member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll report out on um, Central Coast Community Energy Policy Board first. Um, the, the board did hold um, actually a joint operations and policy board meeting last week in Monterey, City of Monterey at the conference center. And um, we basically heard a panel presentation of really where community uh, choice aggregate um, CCAs, as they're known in the state, are heading. Um, 3CE was recognized as one of the first um, uh, CCAs that's really gotten into actually the purchase and, and uh, procurement of clean energy sources. It's been a focus of the agency for the last year, um, including um, some major construction projects underway that are associated with providing um, wind energy, geothermal, and other, and solar, as well as other clean energies. So, um, it was, uh, it's a great presentation. I'm sure you can find it on the, um, on the agency's website. Um, it was a really good panel discussion. They also had um, the, uh, many of the uh, folks, the directors of, state agent, of the state agencies, um, including the California Energy Commission there, um, really providing uh, presentations on kind of the governor's roadmap to get California to zero emissions. Um, and reviewing some of the current um, legislation that was passed this past year. So um, that meeting was held last week on Wednesday, and I'm sure that the presentation will be posted on the website, hopefully um, in the next, uh, you know, next week or so. Um, so that would be, um, would have been on the 20, 21st and 22nd of um, September that those meetings occurred. The agency did adopt a budget um, as well uh, in, the, in the next day's meeting on the 22nd. Um, policy board took action on that as well as um, outlined a new approach to member agency and public grants. Um, and I believe there will be some, you know, just additional work to look at how those grant um, resources are being put out into the community um, there was a lot, quite a lot of discussion in terms of, you know, how to really make the grants most effective, especially with some of the investments coming from the feds on that. So, um, but a good meeting and lots of information, and I'm sure people would be very interested in um, looking up on the website if they get a chance. Um, in terms of the Metro Board, we did meet um, just last Friday. Um, we had a pretty brief meeting, but some highlights. Um, that were pointed out by the new um, the new CEO is really um, branding and looking at um, if you've looked around town or been driving around the county or riding buses, preferably around the county. Um, they've redone most of the bus stops um, and sort of rebranded the look on those, so it's looking really good. Our um, electric buses are up and running, 
um, and you can really see them out and about. Um, they're beautifully sort of um, tagged with, you know, uh, a lot of really neat um, graphics to make them stand out. But I believe we have four in operation right now, so those are fully electric buses. Um, and uh, the agency continues to look at that greening of the fleet, um, and we'll be working on that uh, in the upcoming, really in the upcoming year. There's also going to be a planning session of the board, I believe it's on October 14th, is that right, Sabra Shabra? Um, which will be an in-depth planning session. It will be broadcast, um, and it will be a strategic planning session with the board. And so that would be another thing for folks to look at, look, keep your eyes out. I believe it starts at 9 a.m., correct? So I'll announce that. Um, and I believe that is it for me. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Cummings. Thank you. Um, so Council Member Golder reported out on the Public Safety Committee, um, so I'm not going to speak to that. And I guess the only other item, the only other meeting I was able to attend um, was the Climate Action Task Force. And last at the last City Council meeting, the Council took action on the 2030 Climate Action Plan, and that was pretty much uh, what we had discussed was that coming to Council at the last meeting. So um, that's pretty much it. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I did attend uh, multiple meetings, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to report out on all of them. There was pretty much standard business for the most part. Um, I did want to um, highlight a couple of uh, opportunities for public engagement, though. Um, two in, well, one with the city, one with the RTC, and one with AMBAG. So uh, first I'll just say uh, that the, and you all know this, but I wanna just repeat it here uh, for members of the public that the uh, draft environmental impact reports for coastal rail trail segments eight and nine are out now and the comment period is open. Um, that this, that's the uh, segments that run from uh, Beach Street to approximately 17th Avenue. Um, so for people who are interested in that, you can find out more information um, either at the cityofsantacruz.com website, um, it, go to city of Santa Cruz slash coastal rail trail. Uh, there you can also find information about how to make a public comment. And the city is hosting a meeting uh, about the draft EIR on Wednesday, October 19th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. Again, you can go to that website for information on how to access the, the meeting. And uh, another, piece, another item I wanted to highlight is that the Regional Transportation Commission has entered into a partnership with uh, other coastal counties, um, the kind of Central Coast, and uh, we are working on a um, getting input, public input on uh, the future of electric vehicle charging, uh, placement of stations, and, and kind of the, the overall framework for EV charging uh, on the Central Coast. And um, there's a uh, really cool interactive mapping tool. The public can uh, participate and offer really valuable and really critical input on um, as, as we move through this planning process. Uh, for more information on that, you can look, go to the RTCs, the Santa Cruz uh, sccrtc.org website. There's information right on the front page. Or visit centralcoastevstrategy.com and just go straight to the fun part uh, with the mapping tool. Uh, those and then AMBAG, I, I, um, I did attend AMBAG as the alternate this past meeting, and I wanted to uh, just put out there that the um, Monterey Bay Area's coordinated public transit human services transportation plan, uh, the draft plan has also been published, and there is a comment period for that as well. So, folks who are interested in uh, weighing in or being involved in uh, the conversation about how form funding is uh, distributed to assist nonprofits and um, transit operators in meeting the transportation needs of elderly uh, and disabled people. Um, this is an opportunity to weigh in on how to how to move forward with that planning, and uh, that information is available at ambag.org. Leave it there. Thanks. Thank you for those highlights. Um, Let's see, Vice Mayor Watkins. 
I will, let's see. So public safety was covered. Health and all policies met yesterday and we had an overview on um, some of the work that's been going on in regards to really assessing and how to increase diversity within our commissions. And that will be forthcoming to the full council, which is really informative and um, will hopefully lead to some action for improvement to increase more access and opportunity for all different types of people to participate in civic service in this way. So we um, had a presentation by Community Ventures that was really helpful and informative. Um, and I think that might be the only additional um, committee I have to add to report on. Other than that, the, um, the revenue measure committee continues to meet and discuss um, the current measure, but also other opportunities as we move forward looking at future revenue sources and had a presentation on a parks bond, which was really interesting. So um, I think that's all I have to add. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Um, most of what I was going to report has been reported, but I'll just add to Council Member Meyer's report on the um, Metro Board. Um, there's a huge, huge push to recruit new bus drivers. So um, you can follow the Metro on your social media, and they have a lot of advertisement, not advertisement, but posts on there that, that would be great if you could all share with your networks. Um, we have nine in training right now that will hopefully become new bus drivers, but we are 20 to 25 operators down. So there's a big, big need for um, recruitment of bus drivers. And then the fare free project that we had a couple weeks ago was really successful. They saw an up, uptick in ridership, um, both from students and the general public. That was, I think, a, a week or two span. And um, because I reported on this last time, I'll, I'll report back that unfortunately AB 19, which is the free rides for students, it passed through the legislation, but the governor vetoed it due to the impacts on the budget. So those were my additions. Thank you, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I guess the only thing that I will add, um, I also sit on the Health and All Policies Committee and um, uh, that was already uh, highlighted by Vice Mayor Watkins, the Community Ventures survey data results um, and looking kind of at those structural gaps. Uh, we will continue that work and will we receive a draft report in October to come back in November? We'll be able to make comments on that draft. Um, our two by two meeting was canceled last minute and I do have a visit Santa Cruz meeting tomorrow at three o'clock. On that agenda, there is a president's report, a state of the industry and COVID-19 report a lodging task force update report, and then the CEO's report includes a fall campaign presentation, analytics, symphony and performance metrics, and key data. And I think that concludes my additional updates. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving on to our consent agenda. First up on the consent agenda are items 11 through 21. And now is the time to call in if you are a member of the public streaming this meeting and you wish to comment on consent agenda items 11 through 21. Instructions will be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device when you speak. Raise your hand by dialing star nine or select raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. If you are here joining us in person and wish to speak on a consent agenda item, you can line up to your right, my left, and I will call on you as well. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items? Council Member Brown? Just a quick comment on 15. 
Okay, comment on 15. Okay, looks like that's it. So I will go straight to item 15 is executive employees compensation and benefits plan and council member Brown. I, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm gonna have to register no vote on this item on our consent agenda. I can't today in good conscience support uh, the um, raises that are being proposed for executive management when we have not settled all of our contracts and my back of the envelope uh, uh, <laughs> assessment on the cost of this for um, the for executives is you know at least three hundred thousand dollars. So um, I, I just can't in good conscience support that today. We don't have money for uh, settling our contracts. We uh, need to be fiscally responsible. Um, so just wanted to say that and hopefully Bonnie, you can just record that the time comes thank you thank you council member brown is there any other items before we move on to a consent agenda vote okay so i will go to public comment first i will look to our virtual attendees and participants to see if any hands are raised I'm not seeing any hands raised. Press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us virtually. And I don't see anyone in person lined up to speak. Okay. I will pull it back to uh, council. Is there anybody who'd like to make a motion on the consent agenda items 11 through 21? I'll move consent. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Cummings and a second. I'll second. A second by Vice Mayor Watkins. Can I, just, can I make one comment? Go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, I totally hear what Council Member Brown is saying with regards to the exec executive pay, and I think that with the outstanding um, labor negotiations, I'm just hoping that we can make sure that we're going to provide a fair contract for our workers and um, look forward to seeing how those negotiations pan out. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, are there any other comments before we go to a roll call vote? Okay, may we have a roll call vote? Council member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins? And Mayor Brenner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with the exception of item number 15 uh, with a one no. Council Member Brown, six yeses. Okay, next up on our agenda is item number 22, single use tobacco waste. For members of the public who are joining us virtually and streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. And I'd like to welcome Emmeline. And if you could just state your name and who you are. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Bruner. So good afternoon, Mayor and council members. It's a pleasure to be here today. As Mayor Bruner stated, I'm Emmeline, or M. Um, I'm the new principal management analyst uh, for the city manager's office. So as you may recall from the March meeting, uh, council directed staff um, 
to bring this item back for discussion in August, but due to some scheduling conflicts, uh, it was postponed to September. So here with me, uh, we have Tara Leonard, um, and she is the health educator for the County of Santa Cruz, and will be presenting an update on the tobacco product waste today. So I will hand this over to Tara for the presentation. Thank you. Welcome, Tara. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and council members. I guess I'll just jump right into it. So um, as Emily just mentioned, and as you all know, in April of 2021, this council unanimously passed. Can you speak to the microphone? Thank closer. you. Or lift it up a little so it's closer to your mouth. There we go. How's that? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. This council, oh, there it is, unanimously passed a resolution recognizing tobacco waste as a public health and environmental threat. And as you can see on the next slide, so am I doing the slides? Or do I t ask the person? Great. Okay. Are you Bonnie? Are yes, you Bonnie? that's Bonnie. Nice to meet you. <laughs> as you can see highlighted on the slide, one of the things that was in that resolution is that the council resolved to advance policy approaches to reduce or eliminate this toxic waste in our community. I'm not going to reiterate, and you can go to the next slide, thank you. I'm not going to reiterate all of the content in that resolution or spend most of this presentation talking about the whys because we covered this in April of 2021 and all of you signed that resolution. And there's also going to be a number of resources that I'm providing that'll cover that information. But a few highlights. Tobacco butts are the most littered item on Santa Cruz streets and beaches. We know that they leach dangerous chemicals such as lead, arsenic, and nicotine into our soils, into our parks, into our riverways. They're toxic to wildlife, marine life, children, and pets. They break down into microplastics. Cigarette butts are not made of paper or cardboard. They are made of cellulose acetate. And we're learning more and more about microplastics in our community every day. And moving beyond cigarettes to e-cig devices, these things are a triple threat to our environment. They contain plastic, they contain toxic e-juice, and they contain electronic waste. And I want everyone to remember that nicotine, including the nicotine salt in e-cigarettes, has been listed by the Environmental Protection Agency as an acute hazardous waste. And I believe that there are a number of members of our community, either here in person or remote, who will be adding to this list of whys. So I'm going to move on more specifically to the hows, because I was asked to come here today to give an update on what the county has been doing since April of 2021. So if we can go to the next slide, I'm going to launch right into that. So on the one year anniversary of signing the resolution in April of 2022, a number of individuals and people representing environmental groups spoke during oral communications to urge this council to take action. We appreciate their support, and I think it's really important to keep this issue in the forefront of Council's attention. At the same time, it's important that any action that the Council take is both effective and enforceable. So as part of that process, in giving this update, I'm going to provide you with a number of the tools and the resources that you need to move forward in an efficient and effective manner. Tobacco staff have been working with our Tobacco Education Coalition, with the California Tobacco Control Program, with the Public Health Law Center, and with a number of other state and local organizations to gather data, to review research, to draft model policies, and provide all the tools necessary, as I said, to move forward. Next slide. So what are some of those tools? In February of 2022, just a little light reading, the California Tobacco Control Program published this comprehensive overview of the environmental health and social impacts of TPW. This document compiles the latest research on the proven toxicity of TPW, the social and community impacts of TPW, including health equity and environmental justice implications. And it also talks about the tobacco industry's response, which has been to externalize the cost of their toxic waste onto local governments, nonprofits, and voluntary organizations. 
Probably the most important thing in this document is this final statement that's on the slide there, that cigarette filters, quote, have no benefit in preventing the adverse health effects of smoking. This is really important because as you know, there have been some efforts at the state level to pass TPW related bills and a concern about doing additional harm to smokers was one of the biggest barriers to those, uh, those not moving forward. And now we know, thanks to this document and other research, that that barrier has been removed. Next slide, please. In March of 2022, there was the first meeting of what's called the TPW Economic Model Advisory Committee, and I sit on that committee. <laughs> We know that banning the sale of tobacco products will cost the city in terms of tobacco taxes. However, we also know that tobacco product waste already costs the city of Santa Cruz a lot of money. This statewide TPW Economic Model Advisory Committee is trying to put together a framework to quantify those costs. The advocacy group includes California environmental scientists, economists, public health professionals, statisticians, and tobacco subject experts, including local tobacco staff. And in May, several members of this council, along with several members of the Santa Cruz Public Works Department, attended our first stakeholders meeting, where we tried to identify local cost centers. And you can see some of them up on the slide. Everything from anti-litter education, to mechanical and manual cleanup, to stormwater management, and many, many others. This work is ongoing, and one of the things that the council could consider is allocating staff time and resources to respond to requests from data from this committee so that we can put together a financial understanding of the costs and the benefits of banning the sale of some of these products. Next slide. In April, the Public Health Law Center in collaboration with the American Lung Association, published this, Tobacco Product Waste, a Public Health and Environmental Toolkit. This toolkit includes a menu of recommended tobacco product waste policies, along with background information, legal justification, and model policy language. This is in your agenda packet. One of the things that's important about this is that if council chooses to pursue a tobacco waste policy, Public Health Law Center can work with us to customize language based on the city's current tobacco retail licensing and tobacco control ordinances. Next slide, please. In May of 2022, we learned that the statewide TPW bill sponsored by Assemblymember Luz Rivas and referenced in the TPW resolution will not be moving forward. And that's not a big surprise, because that's what's been the case with all previous TPW efforts at the state level. What does this tell us? It reminds us that TPW is likely to follow the same bottom-up model that we have seen with flavored tobacco products, where local jurisdictions show the public support and create momentum for action at the state level. If you recall, we were all here in the fall of 2018, and the city of Santa Cruz showed great leadership in passing the first ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products in this county. Four years later, here we are. All five jurisdictions in the county have a ban on the sale of flavored tobacco products, and we have a statewide referendum on the issue coming in front of the voters in November. This is a common model of how tobacco waste policy, or tobacco in general policy works. And tobacco waste is likely to be the same. Next slide. And in terms of other updates throughout the year, and of course throughout the last six years, my staff, our partners, have been out in the community educating the public about TPW at presentations, tabling events, cleanup events, with paid and earned media, on our website, on our Facebook page, producing fact sheets, and other forms of outreach. Next slide. In terms of additional tools, you will also find in your agenda packet a list of local tobacco retailers. There are currently 50 tobacco retailers in the city of Santa Cruz. However, it's important to know that different TPW policy approaches would impact retailers differently based on what percentage of their products are tobacco-related 
and whether they are primarily cigarettes or e-cig devices or cigars or glassware or something else. So when you look at that list, you should know that 41 of them are gas stations, grocery stores, convenience stores, liquor stores, for whom the majority of their income is not derived from tobacco products. There are nine stores, however, where at least 50% of their annual gross receipts do come from tobacco-related products, but not all of those stores are the same. So you need to take a good look at that list and understand how the different policy approaches will impact different retailers in different ways. Next slide. And I'd just like to mention the bigger context here. The tobacco retailer landscape, shall we say, is changing. It's changing at the federal level, and it's changing at the state level. At the federal level, we know that the FDA is looking at a number of items around menthol, around e-cigs, around flavors. And as mentioned earlier, we have a statewide flavored tobacco sales ban on the November ballot. It's probably a good time for tobacco retailers to assess the sustainability of their current business model. And one of the ways that we can help them do that is to put together a tobacco retailer work group. The county is willing to facilitate that group to help these retailers transition away from tobacco products, diversify their product line, and foster economic development through other means. And again, because I was asked to provide ideas of what council could do to support those activities, one thing that council could do would be to provide staff to sit on that sort of meeting or that sort of group, that sort of work group. Next slide. And then the final tool that I provided, and it is in your agenda packet today, is a three-page chart of TPW policy options that lay out different approaches to this issue and pros and cons of each approach. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but what it does is it provides the criteria you might consider when evaluating different policy options. I'm not going to go through this entire chart right now, but I'm going to take a look at the first one so you can get an idea of the type of criteria that my staff considered when putting this list together and that you all should consider. Next slide. So the first option is a ban on the sale of single-use filters or butts. And so what you'll see as you go through the options chart is we've looked at the same criteria for each of these policies. The first, how high an impact does it have on the issue? And in this case, it would have a very high impact in terms of source reduction because this is the most littered item on Santa Cruz streets, parks, and beaches. And this is what's considered in public health an upstream solution. In other words, it takes care of the litter before it even gets to our retailers, let alone by the time it already gets onto our streets and beaches and needs to be picked up. It would use existing enforcement protocols, in this case your existing TRL enforcement protocols. It places responsibility on the industry, whereas other policy approaches put responsibility on local governments, local taxpayers, voluntary organizations, retailers, or users. This policy helps to meet California's Clean Water Act trash amendment requirements. I won't go into a lot of detail on that, but I can certainly provide more information to you if you're interested, and your public works department would be more than happy to talk to you about what that means. It has a potential for positive public relations and tourism in terms of people assuming that Santa Cruz is family friendly and pro-environment, there are fiscal savings for city services, such as storm and drain water, litter collection, some of the things we talked about on the EMAC slide. There are potential fiscal savings for healthcare-related services if, in fact, the policy reduces tobacco-related death and disease. And it would be a model for the state and the county. There is no current policy precedent specific to tobacco products like this in the country, even though we do know there are similar ones related to things like plastic bags, plastic straws. On the con side, you want to think about how much a policy might invite industry pushback, including legal challenges. This policy in particular is probably quite likely to invite that kind of pushback. There is indeed a loss of tobacco sales tax revenue. 
there would be a high impact on tobacco retailers who have a high percentage of cigarette sales. Again, that's going to affect retailers differently, depending on which policy you pick. And yeah, there's a potential for negative public relations and tourism. There's going to be people who aren't happy. They would say that this is anti-business. Maybe you'll have visitors who really want to purchase filtered cigarettes in the city of Santa Cruz. And this does not stop smokers from using or improperly discarding filtered cigarettes that they've purchased outside the jurisdiction. This, again, is a similar situation that came up with the flavors ban. Uh, people said, well, it's not fair. If they can't buy these products here, they'll just buy them in Capitola, they'll just buy them in Watsonville. Again, someone has to be first. And now you can't buy those products in all five jurisdictions. So that argument, it, it can definitely hold water for a while until everyone else gets on board. And again, maybe it's a con that there's no policy precedent. Maybe that's a plus. It depends on how you view it. So I'm not going to go through all of these next slides because we don't have time and they're in your packet. I will just read the title so you know some of the other types of policy options. Banning the sale of e-cig devices or single-use e-cig devices. It's worth mentioning that 30 or more California jurisdictions have already done this, including our neighbors to the south in the city of Watsonville. Banning the sale of other tobacco products that create plastic waste, like lighters or packaging or cigar tips. Requiring hazardous waste regulation on tobacco products. This means that you would impose tracking and handling and signage and things like that on nicotine and electronic waste at the point of sale, as we do for other hazardous waste products. There are environmental justice approaches in terms of retailer location and density, because we know that this is an environmental justice and health equity issue. So in this approach, you would look at the demographics of a certain neighborhood and you would say, no, we're not going to allow additional retailers in that environment. The thing to keep in mind on this one is there's no impact to the current tobacco retailer density or improper disposal, but it would limit those for the future. And then there's things that we've tried before, like TPW cleanup taxes, there's deposit and return programs. I've included these in your packet, even though they actually are not recommended approaches by the Public Health Law Center. Um, and I can answer questions about any of these approaches now, or we can have further conversations with, I guess it might be the Health and All Policies Committee. I'm going to stop there. I know it's a lot to absorb, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Is that what we should do? Is that how this works? Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. And um, maybe you could start before I open it up for questions, uh, just briefly explaining the last two items, sure. why they're not recommended. Sure. Well, again, in public health, we have this concept of upstream solutions. And when it comes to cigarettes and, the, and big tobacco, what we discovered is not once in the history of the big tobacco industry have they done the right thing unless forced to do so by law. So when we're looking at solutions with tobacco waste, we like to focus on upstream high-level policy approaches that hold the industry responsible versus individuals. So if you're talking about a TPW cleanup tax, that means it's a downstream solution. The waste already exists. The waste is already on our streets and beaches and playgrounds and parks. And so even though you're going to have a little bit more money to clean it up, the responsibility still lies with us. It still lies with the local taxpayers. It still lies with your voluntary organizations and your environmental groups. So it's not an approach that is particularly effective. The deposit return programs, EPR, we explored this quite a bit in previous in previous work plans, and there's a number of things about it that make it an ineffective approach. It relies extremely um, on the cooperation of tobacco retailers and users. So EPR, for those of you who aren't familiar, means extended producer responsibility. It frequently looks like a take-back program. We know without a doubt that people are not going to take their cigarette butts back to where they bought them. So it's right off the table in terms of our biggest pollution problem. It may, it may be effective for your more expensive e-cig devices, but again, it relies very heavily on retailer and consumer cooperation. And then even when that happens, now you've got all of these hazardous waste at the point of sale. And so you might also need to develop hazardous waste protocols for the proper storage, transportation, and disposal 
of those used devices. Because remember, now they're open, they're leaking, they're not stored properly. So if you were going to look at something like this, I think it would take a lot of um, staff oversight in terms of enforcement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do any council members have any questions at this time? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Hi, thank you for that presentation. Um, very, very informative in the packet as well. Um, just going back to the loss of tax revenue, um, how does this impact our local first five? And I'm not totally clear, do, is there revenue just from the local tobacco tax or is it the statewide and, and does it impact? It's I like am state. afraid I do not know the answer yeah. to that question, okay. but I can certainly find out for you. Okay, thank you, yeah. that was my one question. Oh. To follow up on that, then, do you know how much the annual tax revenue is at the city or, or county level? No, it looks like that might, though. <laughs> um, I also don't have the answer to that question, Councilmember Golder. Um, I thought you might ask it, and uh, <laughs> we're happy to look that up and, and come back with some, some numbers as to what that generates each year. Yeah. To follow up on that, do you, do, is it earmarked for anything, just like, you know, other taxes are uh, no not to my understanding it comes through as part of our general sales tax proceeds any other questions council member Myers you mentioned that there was a bill that that was um, didn't make it onto the floor um, and you said that this is, you know, this is an example of the kinds of things that we say, see just not making it moving forward. Mm -hmm. What kind of what, so I know you spoke briefly about it, but is there, um, is there a specific reason why these, why these types of bills are just failing to move forward? Or is it just that, you know, sure. industry is going to there, there are many reasons. But in fact, the largest reason, in my opinion, is that there's a lot of special interest money at the state level in legislature. And in fact, the American Lung Association has a document that they publish everything, every single year called tobacco money in California politics. And you can literally see how much money each legislator took from the tobacco industry, and then they compare that to their votes on tobacco-related issues. So it's one of the reasons that many of these tobacco issues have more success at the local level than they do at the state and federal level. Okay, Council Member Brown. Just, just really quickly, thank you for that. Is where can we find uh, that information, the report? I'd be happy to send that to you. It's published every year by the American Lung Association in California. So it'll probably be on their website. It should be on their okay, website. Great, but thank you. I can provide it as well. Any other questions at this time before we go to public comment? Okay, thank you. Thank you. In addition to public comment that we will be hearing today, we did receive two emails sent to City Council at cityofsantacruz.com. If you are now interested in commenting on agenda item 22, single use tobacco waste, you can line up to, to your right, my left, if you are joining us in person. If you are joining us virtually, now is the time to raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. The timer will then be set to two minutes. If you do speak in person, please uh, sign up on the clipboard there uh, so that we can ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes. However, it's not required. And at this time, it looks like we have a few folks in person and one uh, hand raised virtually. So I'll start with in person. Hi there, welcome. 
Hey there, uh, my name is Taylor Lane. I'm the founder of the Cigarette Surf Board, longtime uh, Santa Cruz resident here. And um, when we brought this agenda item about, it was really about the single use item facet. And uh, we're not really trying to really take a focus on tobacco so much as the single use issue. Um, the reason is, is that we're pro proposing still selling tobacco, loose tobacco, and selling cigarettes separately, but not allowing for those products to be sold uh, together. When you guys passed this resolution, what was really great was looking at the fact that cigarette butts are the most littered item here in Santa Cruz in our riverways and beaches. And in that resolution, you explicitly stated that the city council would resolve to advance policy approaches to reduce or eliminate this toxic waste. That's why we think going with the single issue approach, approach is really effective because it's less pushback and, and really helps lead the way for other important tobacco policies to follow suit. Um, like Tara had, had put out, um, you know, there's current policy in place that you can use to begin to build um, this piece of policy. Pro bono services will come to your aid. Uh, organizations, national and internationally, will, will be here to help you, and we're here to guide you on that path along the way. We're, we're not going to leave you high and dry. Um, you know, the fear games and tactics that Big Tobacco plays is nothing new, and we need to be very certain to not play into these. Um, change has only ever happened from the ground up, not from the top down, and that's why we think that uh, as one jurisdiction follows, others will lead, and that's really important that we can do that because we have that privilege here in Santa Cruz to do that, to protect this Marine Bay, this Monterey Bay Sanctuary. And, you know, on top of that, really looking at a piece of opportunity for you as leaders to go forth with this. Uh, ultimately, our community, volunteers, and environment pay the real price of this, including our youth. And in radical times, we need radical change. Um, we have an international responsibility to this place. Um, and we would like to also have some attachments here and some distribution to council that we would like to give you for review. So, Thank you. Was Thank that you. the timer buzzer? Okay, that's also, a new sound, so I wasn't sure. I was also informed that I had three minutes and not two, so there must have been a mis miscommunication there. Thank you. Hello, Allie Webster here with Surf Rider Foundation. I brought my jar of butts today um, off from a fresh walk. This is a new jar of butts. I am fully aware that I will become known as the woman who shows up with a jar of cigarette butts. <laughs> Um, I haven't counted them yet, but last time it ended up being over 400 cigarette butts in this jar, and I did this in about an hour in my neighborhood. Um, I assume you've all done the homework that I gave last time around. It's pretty hard not to, looking for cigarette butts everywhere, uh, shoved up along curbs, sitting in the debris, about to fall into storm drains on the sidewalks outside this building. Um, we're here again to express our support in developing policy to ban the single-use plastic cigarette filter. I've seen at least three of you at recent beach cleanups, so you know firsthand that cigarette butts are by far the most common item that we find at our cleanups. The pervasive problem of cigarette litter is absolutely undeniable. The plastic filters and cigarette butts leach thousands of toxic chemicals into our environment. Anyone would be horrified at the idea of me dumping this jar right into the ocean. And yet we walk by hundreds of butts on the ground every day with the same destination, sitting on the beach or heading towards storm drains leading to our waterways. We highly encourage you to focus on this single issue of single-use plastic cigarette filters as a start on this local path against tobacco waste. Focusing on one issue makes the endeavor far more achievable and far less divisive. We also hope that you'll keep the issue's momentum by convening a subcommittee, staff, and stakeholder groups by mid-November, as Taylor Lane um, suggested. I just want to reiterate that we're super grateful that the council has taken this issue so seriously and is working so quickly to move forward with it. We've always been able to rely on the city of Santa Cruz to take unprecedented action in the face of pervasive plastic pollution. Rest assured that the entirety of the Surfrider Foundation nationwide would take notice of and, active, and very actively support this <laughs> remarkable policy work. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for your comment. Um, we are working through a more audible timer ring. So um, thank you for your patience as we work through that. <laughs> um, that. Hi there. Welcome. Afternoon. Um, 
thank you for your service and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Erica Donnelly Green and I'm the current ED at Save Our Shores. I'm an ecologist and I have lived in the community of Santa Cruz since 2004. Um, Save Our Shores has been inspiring and participating in community-driven environmental action in the Monterey Bay for over 43 years. So we've got quite the, the decades there. Cigarette butts and plastics continue to be our top littered item that we collect amongst our 250 more cleanups that we hold an annually. So we all know this is an issue. In 2022 alone, we've already collected over 11,000 uh, cigarette filter butts, and this does not include the recent annual coastal cleanup data that just occurred in 64 locations in Santa Cruz and Monterey counties. So it's important we acknowledge the intersection between human health, ecosystem health. This litter is more than an unsightly nuisance, which you all understand at this point. It is truly toxic. So Save Our Shores is used to tackling big issues. We were founded on ensuring that coastal drilling, oil drilling, would not occur in our marine national sanctuary, thus taking on big oil. We have been successful in local and statewide plastic bag bans and continue to fight against big oil, which is also the plastic in industry, and one and the same, and with other organizations on numerous policy measures to make sure money and corporate interest does not take precedence over human and ecosystem health. The fight against big tobacco is similar, I believe. It will be a big fight and it will take persistence. But please know that you won't be alone in this huge undertaking and many environmental entities will be joining together to support Santa Cruz in this endeavor. Save our shores, we'll not back down to big oil and we won't back down to big tobacco as well. We know that we'll come um, to stop the progress that we seek to make in Santa Cruz, but I think we can take it on together. And so I urge that it's time to put action words and actions together and take a big step forward to make a positive, positive and equitable impact in Santa Cruz. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that was the winner. <laughs> the bell is much nicer than a siren, I think. Are there any other members of the public here in person? Okay, I will move to, we have some more hands that have gone up. Um, the first name with hand raised is I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six to yes. unmute. Hello. Uh, yeah, I don't get the reduction in speaking time to two minutes either. Uh, but anyway, I know as fact, switching from cigarettes to pure nicotine products for those addicted will result in a vast health improvement to them. I sure hope this sort of single use concept doesn't include pure nicotine products, including smoke, smoking cessation aids, even though yes, they could possibly end up as litter. Smokers' health matters also. Health in all policies is a deceptive globalist leftist template policy requiring that every action must be modified when forced through it, which can and has been used to foe legitimize leftist dogma compliance for any agenda. It makes the false assumption no action can be reasonably justified or otherwise implemented without a formatting to agree with HIAP's principles, which can hijack agendas. The noun health has always meant a condition of freedom from disease or abnormality, but HIAP has bastardized it as well as the word equity. HIAP's perversion of the proven just concept of equal opportunity is replaced with a totalitarian forced equal life outcome dogma, which cannot be achieved anyway with this new equity word. Differences are differences and cannot be considered injustice just because they are differences. Blind forest policy attempts to promote equal life outcomes can easily contain elements abhorrent to American principles, such as group identity discrimination, selective loss of individual rights, assignment of unearned privilege to the undeserving, promotes the false sense of inequality equals victimhood, and removes individual responsibility for one's life outcome. Even consideration of sustainability can be abused as who decides what needs sustaining or how is debatable and manipulable, not an absolute automatic no-brainer. Uh, basically, my opinion is any policy that lacks full establishment of sufficient, on balance, logical, standalone justifications without high up mandates should not be pushed over the finish line or needs any preemptive and predominantly leftist high up consideration prior to full rational, factual, reasoned consideration because it can become a. Our next speaker is Madison Hickey, and you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself, and we'll hear from you, and you'll have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hello, my name is Madison Hickey, and I'm a senior at the University of Santa Cruz. 
Being a 23-year-old college student who was ending high school and starting college around the same time single-use vaping devices became popular, I have witnessed my peers become subjected to the influence of tobacco marketing. As a result of this persistent and targeted marketing, most people start vaping and smoking in their teens without fully understanding how addictive nicotine is or the toll it takes on the environment. The tobacco industry produces about 6 trillion cigarettes each year. As a result, cigarette filters are the number one most littered item on earth. Number one here in Santa Cruz too. Each cigarette filter contains thousands of microplastic fibers. Microplastics contaminate our food, soil, water, and air, and ultimately destroy our environment. And because they are made of plastic, they can take years to decompose. Filters are also packed with toxic chemicals like arsenic and lead that seep into our environment and threaten our oceans and wildlife. Traditional cigarette filters were a big part of the waste stream for decades, and single-use e-cigarettes are even more complicated. Because each single-use vape contains a lithium battery, the toxins in the battery can seep into water nearby as it deteriorates. These products harm the environment long before and long after anyone puffs a cigarette or hits a vape. The tobacco industry is a top global plastic polluter whose production and manufacturing directly contribute to climate change and deforestation. And the toxic chemicals in their products make them nearly impossible to dispose of safely. E-cigarettes and nicotine e-liquid are hazardous wastes that should not be disposed of in the regular trash. Tobacco waste is an equity issue. Low-income communities and communities of color bear the highest burden from this toxic waste. I asked the City Council if you could provide a specific date for feedback for the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for your comment. Our next member of the public is Trent Hodges. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Hey there, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to make public comment. Um, City Council, I appreciate the time. My name is Trent Hodges. I'm the Conservation Programs Manager for Save the Waves Coalition. Uh, we are a global nonprofit organization dedicated to protecting surf ecosystems around the globe, and we're based here in Santa Cruz. And we also coordinate and lead the um, Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve here at home, which is one of 12 uh, world surfing reserves uh, across the entire world. And uh, we would just like to support the uh, coalition of groups that have come here to work on this uh, incredibly important issue. We find cigarette butts on all of our beach cleanups um, all across the Santa Cruz World Surfing Reserve. And as we all know, this is um, the most littered plastic item that we find on our coastlines, not even just here in Santa Cruz, but across the world. Um, so we really encourage the city council to take this issue seriously and um, support these recommendations, uh, specifically uh, establishing a product uh, waste task force in the health and all policies subcommittee would be a great start. Um, and many of the groups here would be more than happy and willing to lend our expertise and data to help support um, that group as they explore uh, solutions to this, this issue. Um, we'd also support um, bringing this item back to the council by no later than the second meeting in February to discuss um, possible solutions to this issue. Um, as you all know, uh, in the state of California, there's been um, legislation to ban the single use filter. Um, there's been different policy solutions offered in, in different municipalities and cities. So I'd really encourage the city council to take a look at what policies we can really be done here in Santa Cruz um, so we can lead uh, this issue across the entire state of California. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Rachel Kippen. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for um, taking this issue on and for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rachel Kippen, proud to co-chair the Santa Cruz County Tobacco Education Coalition. Um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank council members who have worked with our commission tirelessly, particularly council member Watkins. I encourage anyone and everyone who's interested in continuing to move forward on this kind of strategy to join us for our public meetings. Our next one is on November 16th. It's from 9.30 to 11 and it's virtual. Um, and that information can be found on the County Public Health website. Um, also just wanna reiterate understanding that this policy I know is very challenging. The tobacco industry is a formidable enemy. There's so much to consider 
going into um, this kind of really strong kind of Goliath challenge that we have ahead of us. Um, and it's also so very worthwhile. Um, as you all know, and as we've talked about, you know, Mark Stone brought legislation forward several times and the tobacco lobby killed it before it even made it out of committee. Um, so there's so much um, that I think we could accomplish here at the local level, but do recognize that, um, that it's not an easy haul. So thank you so much again for um, creating this opportunity for us to be heard and also for um, creating the Health and All Policies Committee to hear this. Uh, that's all I wanted to share. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public has a phone number ending in 1045. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi there. It looks like you're unmuted, but I'm not hearing anything. I'll give it one more second. Try pressing star six again, maybe, and unmuting and unmuting yourself again. Okay, it looks uh, like... Can everyone hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Uh, dear Me Mayor Brunner and City Santa Cruz City Council members, my name is Elena and I'm 12 years old and a member of Friday Night Live, also known as FNL, the Youth Leadership Program. I am here to speak on behalf of our Youth Council on the topic of tobacco waste. Starting last school year, FNL dedicated our time to understanding the impact of tobacco waste. We designed a project to educate our peers and community on this issue, and we are passionate about reducing tobacco waste in the city of Santa Cruz. Through our research, we have learned that tobacco waste is a serious public health and environmental justice issue. To learn even more about how tobacco waste affects us locally, we hosted small cleanup events around Santa Cruz, despite smoking being illegal at these locations, we found over a thousand littered cigarette butts in the downtown Santa Cruz area. We are shocked by this because we know that cigarette butts leach hundreds of toxic chemicals into our water and soil, which is a big deal for our wetlands and beaches. As part of our project, we also developed a signature for of support for uh, a petition. Uh, for asking community members to support regulation to reduce the impact of single-use cigarette filters in the city of Santa Cruz. We collected 87 signatures from residents of the city. We thank you for your leadership so far, and we look forward to the adoption of a policy as best practice solution because we know that this can make a positive impact on the health and well-being of youth, our community, and our environment. Please continue prioritizing and protecting youth and our natural environment from the toxic waste by establishing a specific timeline from the cell committee will bring back these important policy recommendations and exactly what and when next steps will be. Thank you for your time and leadership in addressing this important issue. Thank you. Appreciate your public comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, so I will bring it back to council. And um, let me go back to my agenda. Okay, I'm going to bring it back to council for any motions or comments, questions. Okay, Vice Mayor Watkins, Council Member Cummings. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you for, um, first and foremost, for being here and for the presentation. I want to thank Tara for taking the time to really create a really thoughtful presentation of all the pros and cons associated with the various policy options. But more so, I'd like to thank everybody for all the work that they do tirelessly on this issue day in and day out. 
um, really informative, really helpful information for us to consider. I want to thank M for um, creating this uh, recommendation. I, I have questions that, as a member of the Health and All Policy Subcommittee, I'd like to dive into, so I look forward to really addressing that at that time. One of which is really um, asking our law enforcement their capacity for enforcement if there was such a ban. I know that's been an issue in other um, areas in terms of some of the existing policy we have on the books with the flavored ban. So just really getting into it. What's possible? What do we need to do? What does this mean for our community? That's the work that we did when we had our flavors ban come before us. It took about a year. We met with all kinds of retailers, other uh, stakeholders, really looked at the nuances of the ordinance and just did the work. And um, I know that public outreach and community outreach and due diligence is a priority for me and it's also a priority for, I believe, a number of my colleagues here. Um, so with that, I am uh, prepared to move the recommendation. I did want to also add that, you know, we look as staff uh, about having some of the additional uh, suggestions that Tara brought up in terms of having our staff sit on the state work group. I don't have that specific work group's name. I don't know, Tara, if you want to come back up and share that or if that would be forthcoming either way. You're welcome to come if that's okay. Yeah. I didn't catch the read. exact name. Sorry, I thought you were done. If you could repeat that when you're done. Sure, sure, sure. I just I thought you were done. The, um, I know that you mentioned having support um, from the city staff on the existing work group that's happening at the state. Right. So there's so. two work groups. There's the Economic Model Advisory Committee, which okay. is run by Dr. Tom Novotny out of San Diego State University, and that I sit on, and that is statewide, to look at the financial issues related to the ban. Okay. And then the other one we talked about a little bit was having some sort of retailer committee transition for small businesses. So that would be sort of a separate idea. Additional. Okay. So I'll go ahead and add the first one, which is to work with the state. Um, if they allow us or welcome us, that I'll direct staff as a part of this to join that so that we're understanding. Sorry, I, I don't think. Yeah. I can't hear a word. Okay. 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 So it's, I'd like to have it so that we remove the recommendation and include a direction for staff to join the state work, um, work group with further clarification on the possibility of that through Tara. Okay. Well, let's, okay. let's take a minute and... Um, oh, I can email it. Okay, I'll go let's ahead. Let's take a minute and you can email it. It's really hard to hear. Um, and we do also have a 5.30 oral communication start time. 5.45. 5.45? Okay. Then we will, okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I'll email it. It's just to join the state work group. To have our city join the state work group. The state work group and the economic modeling. Oh, so to have the city join the state work group. On the economic modeling work that's happening. Yeah, we got it. Did you get it? Yeah. Okay, I could e I'll email it to you. Uh -huh. I'd like to ask the city attorney if I can, what I can do with the noise disruption so that we can continue conducting business. I think it's worth requesting that the uh, members of the uh, community that are protesting outside uh, keep the voice down so that the so that the council business can continue. Short of that, I would recommend that you. Uh, you adjourn the meeting, uh, and because this is obviously designed to disrupt what's going on here. Um, if people want to speak at oral communications, that's one thing, but But I can't hear anything, so... Disrupting the meeting so that you can't have oral communications is sort of contrary to the whole purpose of the meeting, so that's an option. Um, so I can ask the, the protesters to... Um, politely right. keep it down or we adjourn the meeting. Right, and um, technically disruption of a public meeting is a misdemeanor, but um, it's outside of the meeting. Typically, that's not been a typical recourse that the council's taken for, for uh, disruptions outside of the meeting. Okay, so um, Council Member Brown. I was just going to say, I think they're probably going to stop pretty soon because the intention is to come in for oral communication. So um, if take a crack at it. 
Please. <laughs> well, there is a lull, a so we might be able to get item. through this item. Yeah, let's just know. take a two minutes. I'll go out there and just see if we can just get through this item before oral communications. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion from Vice Mayor Watkins, mm -hmm. but I'm not clear what it is. It sounded like you added something. And I texted it. Bonnie. Bonnie's got it. Okay. The language. I'm going to call a two minute recess. So um, sorry for the disruption, but we cannot conduct city business. Yeah. If I cannot hear, anybody can hear. So just give us two minutes, please. Okay, I will um, ask the city clerk. We will try to resume through this item. I will ask the city clerk to please post. Um, I think there was a uh, motion made by Vice Mayor Watkins. I did not hear the full motion. So in, in order to really understand the motion, if we could have it maybe up on the screen if that's possible. Okay, so it looks like you, from the agenda, added the third sentence, direct staff to join the state work group addressing the economic model associated with tobacco waste. We will work through this motion as best we can. I just added that, but I... The seconder to return in the spring with an update. Okay, there was a recommendation in February. I'm just curious how you came with spring. I just, I am. Um I'm just concerned about the timeline associated with that personally. I think the Health and All Policies Committee is wrapping up our work with the equity issues and um, recommendations associated with our commissions. And then they have the holidays. I'm actually going to be um, out of town for part of February personally. And so I thought in terms of our ability to really dive into it, having a little bit more of a runway and uh, with the, within the spring sometime being a good kind of middle ground for an update potentially. And or recommendations if that's appropriate. So the Health and All Policies Committee has been meeting every other month. And so October, December, February, and April, so that would mean April, by the April. Mm -hmm. I'm comfortable with April, if we want to put April. April? Are you comfortable with that? Yes. Okay. So has everyone had a chance to read, read this? Um, and so we had a... Uh, second by council member Myers is that correct uh, are there comments council member Cummings I have a number of questions and comments <clears throat> the first of which is um, from what 
Council or Vice Mayor Watkins just said, and also um, I called Tiffany Wise West about this because um, she's the staff person in charge of health and all policies. And so I was just curious because it sounds like there's a lot of work happening with health and all policies right now, and I'm just wondering how this would fit into that work plan because it sounds like you know if we embark on this endeavor, it's going to be a pretty big lift. It's going to require um, a substantial amount of staff time. And given that Tiffany's also has the Climate Action Task Force and this, you know, would it be appropriate? I just want to understand how this fits within that work plan because it might be that if we go down this route, rather than it being health and all policies, it can be another subcommittee that's specifically focused on tobacco product waste. And so I'm just wondering if you, if someone can speak to kind of what her workload is looking like so we're not just dumping another big project on a staff member. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, I, I, yeah, I will give it over to our city manager, uh, Matt Huffaker. Uh, thanks, Mary. Thanks for the question, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Tiffany does have a full plate, as the council knows, including uh, the tremendous work that she's um, moving forward on our climate action and resili resiliency front. Having said that, uh, we thought the health and all policies had some strong alignment uh, with the spirit behind this request. And I think the additional uh, runway we have, as Councilmember uh, Watkins described, will give us time to, to work through how best to resource it. Um, but uh, again, I would defer to the council if there's interest in wanting to form a standalone subcommittee specific to this topic. Um, that's, that's certainly an approach we could take as well. Um, that was my first question. I have some comments that I want to make on this item. Um, first of all, I want to thank the folks from the Cigarette Surfboard and all the other environmental um, nonprofits who've reached out to us and also the county um, for um, reaching out as well. I know that this is a big issue for a lot of people and I just want to highlight a few things um, related to this topic. The first of which is that in 2019 there was a study that came out that highlighted um, how microplastics are being found in Monterey Bay from the surface all the way to the seafloor. So this is an extremely major environmental uh, health concern and environmental justice issue for our community, given that we're the stewards of um, this very sacred place that we call Monterey Bay. Um, and a lot of it, and, and I, I would imagine that a big contribution of the, the plastic waste that's in the Monterey Bay is coming from cigarette butts. Um, with the resolution that was passed, this is an opportunity for us to take uh, the first step um, in terms of taking action on that resolution. Um, the presentation, and uh, I think a lot of our conversation has highlighted how our leadership on flavored tobacco ban has caused a ripple effect in the county, and this is an opportunity for us to lead once again on cigarette butt waste. Um, I agree with the um, people who brought this forward and the presentation that we received today that we need to take small steps, and that that first step is to start with single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes. Um, I'm supportive of this direction. I'm supportive of the recommendations brought forward today by uh, members of our community. And um, I just want to point out, too, that um, a couple of things that may have been overlooked. In 2019, Beverly Hills actually moved forward with a ban on all tobacco, which went into effect in 2021. And we haven't heard about big tobacco going after the city of Beverly Hills. My understanding from what the community wants right now is not for us to go, again, go after tobacco. It's to go after the single-use plastic filters that go on cigarettes. Um, and so uh, I want to be supportive of this direction. Um, I would actually ask if we could maybe um, consider as friendly amendments much of the language that was provided to us by community members, um, which uh, really states that we would establish a tobacco product waste task force consisting of the health and all policy subcommittee or an ad hoc subcommittee if the current workload for the health and all policies is too great, and interested community stakeholders, which may include but is not limited to, representatives of the Cigarette Surf Board, Save the Waves, Save Our Shores, Surfrider Foundation, Oceana, Santa Cruz County Tobacco Education and Prevention, and other interested stakeholders to work on banning the sale of single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes, convene the subcommittee, uh, health and all policies, or the assigned ad hoc committee, staff and stakeholder groups by no later than mid-November to begin discussions and establish a timeline for future meetings, and then bring back an item to council no later than the second meeting in February 2023, outlining a process and timeline for community outreach, stakeholder engagement, and ordinance development. And, um, and then also include the, and um, 
So I'll, I'll just leave that there, that if those could be accepted as friendly amendments and maybe some of the timeline could be adjusted. But I think that, um, well, I can remember personally that uh, Save Our Shores had a, a beach cleanup for um, national or, or global beach cleanup day last year and the cigarette surfboard folks were out there for that event. I remember picking up uh, cigarette or uh, doing the beach cleanup with the mayor and this conversation came up at that time. And so seeing as how that was summer of 2021, here we are in summer of 2022. And I think that there's some interest in bringing this forward and trying to see what this timeline can look like for implementation. And so um, I know that members of this group have also been reaching out to council members since early, well, last year and early this year, and it's taken us up till now to even get this on the agenda. And so um, I think that what they're recommending is appropriate to be able to kind of begin these discussions, start laying out that timeline and what the process could look like so that we can begin taking action on this. And so I'll leave my comments there, but that's uh, the friendly amendment I would like to make is, is to incorporate the community recommendations on this item. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, for clarification, it sounds like your amendment would, in addition to Health and All Policies Subcommittee, in currently has labor negotiations happening as um, we we had in our closed session this morning and so um, that's what that is about um, I will return to councilmember Cummings I'm just trying to get clarity your amendment is adding not just the health and all policy subcommittee but additional stakeholders so you're enlarging the group of folks to meet um, is the first part. The second part um, is convening by mid-November to begin discussions. So health and all policies meets next in December, every other month. So I think that for many of our subcommittees and our groups, we kind of dictate the timeline for when we meet. And given that this, and also, as part of this, if this doesn't go to, to health and all sub to health and all policies subcommittee, an, another subcommittee can be formed that could establish the timeline for when they want to meet and can address this item. And I know I, I when I spoke with Tiffany, I thought they're supposed to be meeting in November because this is September. They're not meeting in October. They're going to meet again in November. Um, so that was my understanding. And that's why I also suggested November. I'm sorry, we're not in October, no. we're in September. <laughs> so it is every other month, and so we are meeting then in November. So, um, Mayor and Council, forgive me, I'm losing track a little bit in terms of uh, the friendly amendment and the timing around when the work would start. Um, so perhaps we can get clarification on that. What I would ask is that we have enough runway to work with Tiffany and the Health and All Policies Committee to um, get a solid process in place. Um, so the, the original motion, I think, was to start that in spring of next year. Was there, um, was there a suggestion to, to change that? So if I can speak to this, um, what I was bringing up is to have an initial convening of that group. So one of the things that I found that has been effective in my time on the council is not just having council members and staff work on these issues, but work on these issues with members of the community who are being impacted, who are stakeholders. This isn't just the you know nonprofits and and the people who are um, you know from the environmental groups that are supporting this. We also the reason why that it's left open, I imagine, is because um, 
you know, there's it says other interested stakeholders, which would likely mean some of the business owners in the community as well. Yep. And the idea is if we can all work together on these things, you know, we, we can be more effective and, and reduce the amount of pushback. And so just having initial meetings, it seems like makes sense. And then bringing, being able to start thinking about what the process looks like. Uh, so thanks for that clarification, Councilmember Cummings. That's certainly the intent of this approach in developing an implementation plan that would have our stakeholders around the table mm -hmm. as part of that discussion. That in and of itself will take some time and work uh, to put a thoughtful process together. Our hope would be to launch that um, within the time frame originally recommended, but it, I'll defer to the council. And I'll just, oh, I'll just say that you know, we're putting this out here so that we can discuss and you know, provide, if there's a need for flexibility, we can provide that. But I think that, as I mentioned before, you know, this came up in 20, summer of 2021. They, the, these individuals have been writing us since you know, fall of last year. They wrote us a bunch in the winter of this year. They've been trying to get us to take action on this. It's been kicked down the road, and we finally, you know, they came to us during oral communications, and that was the only way we could actually get this on the agenda. So um, understanding that it's going to take some time, I think that, you know, what we're trying to do today is be responsive to people who have been waiting a long time to have their voices heard. Uh, understood, Councilmember Cummings, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that as well. Um, wanting to ensure that uh, the, the magnitude of the, of the regulations we're contemplating here will require some significant uh, outreach and conversation. Uh, and, I, and I know you and the, the council um, understand and, and appreciate that. And just wanting, wanting to ensure we've got staff bandwidth to, to do it justice. And I just want to point out in the third point that the meeting in February is really to bring back outlining a process and timeline for community outreach, stakeholder engagement, and ordinance development. So the idea being that I think everybody in this room knows that this isn't going to be something quick, um, but being able to get, have some response of what that timeline is going to look like kind of sooner than later since people have been waiting for over a year and a half makes sense. Okay, I'm going to ask the maker of the motion if it's clear what the friendly amendment is um, and in terms of enlarging the group and the February yeah. bringing back I, the outline. I, I, I think it's a little bit inconsistent with the original motion in terms of the timeline. Um, but one thing that could be a potential compromise or suggestion is that the meeting to the first meeting of the ad hoc committee to focus on some of these recommendations and then to really think about how that could be kind of implemented. Certainly these are some of these stakeholders and there's an extensive list of probably a, a number of other stakeholders that aren't included here. Um, so I think I personally feel like happy to consider these, but want to take a step back and start with that first committee meeting to really look at who are the stakeholders, how do we want to do the outreach, what are the various policy options. I have questions about a specific ban and implementation and frankly enforcement feasibility of that because I don't think we have, we heard yesterday in our public safety committee meeting, we have a serious staffing shortage and usually that falls at our law enforcement. And if we're going to have differentiated products being um, kind of banned, then I think we need to have a way to enforce that. So anyways, I just have a number of questions. Nonetheless, I'm happy to take these considerations as a member of the public health, I mean, excuse me, the Health and All Policies Committee, and really factor them in in terms of the outreach plan, but don't necessarily feel as comfortable with some of them because there's a little bit of limitedness that I would like to expand upon, as well as the dates, but knowing that we're at time I think um, if that could just be incorporated as a, uh, not necessarily a friendly amendment to really adhere to the timeline, but as the first sort of step for the committee to look at these recommendations, would that be acceptable? Um, I mean, it'd be direction to the committee to look at these recommendations. The recommendations on the cigarette surfboard flyer that we received. And this, the, yeah. the, this exactly. Oh, Councilmember Brown. Uh, and so, Councilmember Brown. I, I'm just um, <clears throat> hoping that we can try to work through that because I do understand the, the timeline and I'm sensitive to the workload. Um, and so I, I'm, but I'm, I'm also very sensitive to the fact that there are many community members who have been uh, speaking up about this for a, a long time now and, um, you know, wanting to get something going. Um, 
seems like it would be a good idea for us to at least take, even if it's not the full process, uh, some steps to engage with community members before next spring. Because if we just send back to staff and the committee to do that work, it's all happening behind the scenes. And there are a lot of people in the community who won't necessarily know how to plug in, to be involved. And so I'm just wondering if, if what I think I hear Councilmember Cummings saying is um, you know, some way of getting the process going, um, even if it's somewhat informal and it's information gathering and having conversations, and we don't need to have a fully formed program before we do that. So, um, so maybe just like if there's some way to kind of think about how we could take some steps now, in anticipation of having moving forward in the along the lines you're talking about. Uh, uh, if I may, uh, Mayor, and uh, thanks for that suggestion, Councilmember Brown. Uh, that's a helpful way to frame it. I don't think uh, there would be any challenge with us having an initial discussion with the health and all policies at, at the next meeting, acknowledging that we're not going to have a, an outreach implementation engagement plan fully fleshed out yet, but talking about the initial council direction we've received and the plan to move forward with it in earnest over the next several months. If that helps to thread the needle there. I I think because we are meet, meeting in November and that could be the opportunity to really start a first dive at this. I'd like to look at these recommendations. I'd also like to look at the full list of pros and cons that Tara from Public Health presented us, as well as the model policies that were in the packet um, and, and, exist, and uh, some of the questions in, in consideration that were brought up in terms of the funding circumstances. So for me, I think it's sort of all inclusive if, if the direction could not be as specific, but more or less to have a friendly amendment to really look at the recommendations from the cigarette surf board, to look at the recommendations within the agenda packet, to look at the pros and cons list, and then to, to, to have sort of the timeline as set out in that we would meet in November um, and really engage our stakeholders, but also have a meaningful process, you know, set up to ensue beyond, um, beyond, beyond the first meeting as well. Council member Cummings. Thank you. I, I don't think that there's anything stopping the Health and All Policies Committee from exploring those other options, but I think what is important is that the people who brought this item to our attention, the members of the community, um, and the people who we've heard from today are really wanting us to focus on moving forward with this ban on single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes. And, you know, I think as council members being responsive to that, seeing as how it's taken so long, that's why that specific language is being called out because that is something that it seems that the community really wants us to take action on right now. Um, and, you know, just understanding that we're going after big tobacco, um, trying to go after all these different things, these different items um, would be really challenging and, and would drag this process out even longer when this group is really trying to focus on one single issue. Um, and the more we take on, the more divisive it's going to be. So. I think that's why calling out this language specifically right now at this point is important. And you know, we can we have this information now. Council members, different subcommittees can bring back any of those recommend those other recommendations at any point in time. Um, but really, you know, calling it out and saying that we're going to take action on this one specific step is something that I think would be important for our community, especially because of the amount of waste it generates um, on our beaches and the amount of threat it has to our environment. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, Council Member Myers. Just, I guess I just have a question. So I understand in 2017, 2018, so we did, we were the first city in the county to ban um, the flavored tobaccos, correct? And um, so that was a single, in a sense, focused, you know, effort. And do we, how have we, how have we done on the enforcement of that? I mean, it's good to have a law in the books, but I'm just curious about if there's ever sort of been a look, because that's another thing I think the committee could do in that just making sure that the policy that we do pass is effective. And I've heard a couple of different things today. I've heard, let's do this focused thing. And I've also heard, you know, look across the suite of, um, of, of basically the uses of single use um, you know, materials to, to basically smoke with. So we're sort of talking slightly about two different things, you know, tobacco, obviously, I can see the public health and especially the children's piece in trying to get kids to not start using flavored tobacco. 
but uh, um, I'm just curious how our enforcement efforts have gone. I'd like to make a recommendation if perhaps um, we have a motion on okay. on here and I think um, you know the November health and all policies meeting that will be the wrap up of our equity work that we the health and all policies committee has been working on and I think that would be a good time to start with this and come perhaps a uh, friendly amendment could be in February with an outline and community engagement of all the stakeholders to start on this next for the year. Yeah, I like for that. For 2023. Mayor. So, however that's worded, if someone wants to make that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll yeah. go ahead and make that friendly <laughs> <That's> amendment. <great. laughs> um, but we already have a friendly amendment on on the floor here, so I'm not sure. I think what if I could I'll just I think that the friendly amendment on the floor isn't consistent with the motion so I won't accept the friendly amendment but I will say that this is as suggested in the original maybe what could be changed is that um, within the original motion to have the health and all policies committee review the cigarette surfboard and other policy suggestions at their first meeting in November so it incorporates the review and then I accept your friendly amendment to have that timeline more associated specifically with ha uh, having that committee report out in February, which will encompass some of the assessment of that, those recommendations. Uh, as well as working with all the stakeholders which is and your friend, community yes. groups, right. which is yeah, I would be part of council member Cummings friendly amendment, I think is key. I, I would even, I don't know if I could work on her friendly amendment before you, but I, I think it would be important that the health and policy, health and all policies actually, um, you know, do what is in, in the suggestions here from the community, which is to convene a potential um, stakeholder, um, stakeholder committee. So, I mean, again, you know, how you want to do that and when that takes place, but I think, um, you know, making sure that there is heavy stakeholder input would be super important. Um, it, it's all over the place. So it kind of sounds like it's the motion and then the friendly amendment are bullet one and two with three going to the, or the other way around, one and two going to the high app and the third one is part of the motion. Can we, um, I'd, I'd also like to consider maybe going to oral communications. Let's finish this. You want to finish it? Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to finish this I and just, then we'll move on to oral communications. I think if I think if in the interest of time because I know we're trying to move on to oral communications if we just um, incorporate these suggestions without breaking down some of the uh, specifics into the first meeting of the health and all policies committee um, which is rooted in naturally and necessarily rooted in collaboration with a number of these organizations amongst others um, to have a report back I think is in February with an update is, is um, appropriate but not necessarily inclusive of a full established work plan. Um, I'm comfortable with that. I think if we needed to go through these, I would feel like I would need to go through these a little bit more, but I don't think in the interest of time. I'm, I'm sorry, if I could have you read what you wanted to say because okay. you're kind of paraphrasing and I can't um, understand the difference between yours and Jeff, or Council Member Cummings. Okay. Just so I get it right. So my um, recommendation is the original motion there on the screen and to incorporate, so direct staff and then to another bullet. another bullet. So just to backtrack, you are not accepting the friendly amendment and you're, you're amending your original motion? Yes, because I feel like if I accept the friendly amendment, it's inconsistent with the actual main motion. Okay. So what I'm suggesting is that the Health and All Policies Subcommittee at their November meeting. Yes. Review these recommendations in addition to the other recommendations presented in the agenda packet. And then. Does that work for you? 
second does the second yeah, of the motion. I'll, I'm fine with that. And then do you want to? And then I had a friendly amendment. to uh, bring back uh, in February an outline and uh, a stakeholder group that can work all together on moving forward with, with this topic. And I'm not going to spell out all of the organizations there, but um, I think that's included in some of the motion no. recommendations. And there's probably more that we can identify in that November meeting. I'll accept the friendly amendment. I will too. And that could, okay. Okay, Council Member Cummings. So I guess for the interest of time, I think what I'm going to do for the record is I'm just going to make a substitute motion, which would be the recommendation that was brought forward by the Cigarette Surfboard Group. And I think part of that is because, you know, really focusing on the ban of the sale of the single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes was the whole purpose of this. And I just want to make sure that, you know, and I don't think that that's, while it might be taken into consideration, um, I think what's before us is really trying to focus on that topic. And there's other opportunities in the future to address the other issues. But this group has reached out extensively to council members to try to you know, have us work on this. And I know um, oftentimes they felt ignored because they weren't, people weren't responding to their emails. And so I'm trying to be responsive to them and what they've been trying to move forward for a long time. So I'm going to make the um, cigarette surfboard recommendation as a substitute motion. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Second. Is there a second? Okay. We have a substitute motion by Council Member Cummings, seconded by Council Member Brown. If I could just say, I'm I'm seconding this because I am concerned about um, the the way that the the recommendations are being incorporated. I, I mean, I would just like to see some. Um, a little bit more of an affirmation that this this particular issue is going to be considered um, with it. And I'm, I'm not opposed to looking at a broader range. I mean, I think it's very important that we look holistically at this um, the set of challenges we have. But I, I do want to see this proposal being taken seriously. So um, and I'm, I'm just worried that it's going to get lost if we don't um, make it more explicit. Vice Mayor Watkins. I just have a, a brief comment. I'm not going to be able to support the substitute motion. I do appreciate the advocacy and work, and I just want to acknowledge the work that happens on a regular basis with tech and with the county public health efforts that are happening around environmental waste policy. I think that, um, you know, we as a council want to do our due diligence, and certainly I appreciate the sense of urgency. Naturally, this is a critical issue for our our environmental stewardship, and at the same time, I think we want to be really thoughtful, particularly if we're going to be the first in the nation. And it could actually lend itself, this work could lend itself to bringing forward a ban on single-use um, filtered tobacco cigarettes, but it could not be enforceable, potentially, and we want to ask those questions. What might be enforceable is a full ban on all tobacco products. I don't know, but I want to look at what the options are. And so as much as I really appreciate and frankly will, as a member of the committee, will look at some of these recommendations, I, I want to do my full due diligence on what's best in terms of the various policy options and limiting that for me does not feel appropriate this time, given that we could actually achieve a lot of impact with a different policy option potentially. And so for me, I think um, certainly this will be something to be explored within the committee It is part of the recommendations within the actual um, uh, agenda packet. Uh, certainly this is the work that's happening with tech. I recommend that anybody who's interested in working on tobacco policy join tech and the meetings happen on a regular basis. So if that's something that's op an open meeting, um, Council Member Cummings, if that's something you'd like to be connected to, I'm happy to share that information with you in terms of the, regular, the work that's happening on a regular basis within our community in terms of the county work. Um, but at this time, given the 
uh, direction, I feel comfortable with the original motion and therefore will not be supporting the substitute motion. Thank you. So are there any other comments before we vote on the substitute motion? Um, yeah, I just, I guess I just like to, to state it's kind of an awkward situation that, you know, um, be working, you know, working in this field for so long and sort of be, be made to, to make a choice tonight. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, policy development is, is a long and arduous path. And, um, you know, I think we've seen proof, you know, just with some of the recent failures in, um, in the policy that even at the state level has been um, not working. Um, and very few cities doing this work. I, I just think the due diligence to just start with a full list rather than just one item makes a lot of sense. Um, and um, it may feel like we're not um, receptive or, or acknowledging people's concerns on the specifics with the single-use tobacco, um, single-use filtered tobacco um, cigarettes, basically. Um, but I just think that as we work our way through the policy development, it's, it is worth starting with a broader discussion and then narrowing. It's not to say that the process as, as currently um, proposed in the existing motion, in the, in the initial motion, would um, not end up with um, a recommendation to move forward in single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes. So um, it's a little awkward to have um, sort of what I think is a little bit of a duel right now, but I don't think that the process proposed in the original motion will ever, does not negate that we may not end up with single use um, cigarettes as a focus. So I just wanna make that clarity. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna support the substitute motion just because of the, the way it's kind of rolling out. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Um, I also would just like to say that uh, the original motion does uh, definitely, from my understanding, prioritize all the recommendations that have been brought before us today um, and sets a, a clear path for us to begin working on that. And um, I appreciate all of the organizations and as well as the county presenter who is here who also offered all the resources that could help us as we look at this. It is a priority. And um, so I think the original motion encompasses all of that and we do need to um, really look at that. So I also will not be supporting the substitute motion. All right, are there any other comments? We'll go to a, a roll call vote, please, for the substitute motion. Council Member Kalantari Johnson? No. Over? No. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? No. Vice Mayor Watkins? No. And Mayor Bernard? No. That motion does not pass five, no, two yeses. Um, okay, so we have an original motion that is still on the floor. Council member Cummings. Can we just have that language posted? The what? The language for the motion. One thing that's missing is the direction to have staff join the state. That was the other bullet. Let me reread that. Yeah. <laughs> Council member Cummings. When, yeah, when it's appropriate. If now's the time. Um, I think. Uh, 
Are you thinking of? No, the, some of the language wasn't there before, so that's why. Yeah, we're getting that added back in. Do you want me to reread that, uh, Bonnie? This part right here? Yeah, that was just added back. That's that's what was. That's added, but also to direct staff to join the state work group addressing the economic model associated with tobacco waste. That was the edited portion of my original. I do think it's important that we stay connected to a lot of these bigger issues, and naturally, we'll have a bigger impact. So. Oh, thank you. And I guess in my friendly amendment, it would just, the word identified stakeholder group. Mayor Brunner in February, an outline and identified stakeholder group that can work together on moving forward with this topic. I. That's not a complete sentence. Uh, I know, I type it as they talk, so I, 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 I fix it afterwards. Maybe identified <clears throat> to return in February with an outline and identified stakeholder groups that can work together on moving forward with this topic. Sorry, say that again. Requested to return in February. With an outline and identified IED. There we go. I did, for clarification, um, identified stakeholder groups that can work together is, I'm wondering if for clarification, should that be with staff, the subcommittee, staff and the subcommittee on um, moving forward with this topic? I'm just, it's just not clear with what, when, you, when we say identified stakeholder groups that can work together, is that those groups working with each other or is that, I mean, trying to really spell out that they're working with the subcommittee and city staff I see what you're saying. With an outline and identified stakeholder groups who would be working with staff and the subcommittee mm -hmm. to... Um, well, that's implied. I mean. It's just spelled out. Uh, are you okay with that <laughs> amendment on my friendly sure. amendment? Thank Me you, too. Council Member Cummings. Mayor Brunner requested to return in February with an outline and identified stakeholder groups who would be working with staff and the subcommittee so the high up subcommittee that can work together on moving forward. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So I'll just okay. Comment. Yeah. So just final comments. Um, and I think that although the language that wasn't that the community brought forward wasn't accepted, my hope is that um, the direction that we're going to take will really um, allow for a review of these topics and that the banning of single single banning of the sale of single-use filtered tobacco cigarettes is the top priority. I think that's one of the things that came out in our presentation today that, you know, we really started going into detail on that and we really didn't go into the other items because it's clear that this is one of the top priorities given that it's one of the biggest um, litter items that we find in our community and in our environment. And so I just want to emphasize that as this moves forward, my hope is that that is taken as uh, a priority and, um, and if other items come with it, so be it. But um, my hope is that this process will um, be transparent and will also be done in a timely way that really you know, provides opportunities for community to engage on this item. And so um, although the other, rec the, the other motion didn't pass, I'll be supporting this because I do feel that you m we need to continue moving forward on this topic and on this item. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, and just for clarity, I would like to just quickly comment the language uh, from the community was accepted in the motion and incorporated into the motion to begin starting in November. Um, so I really want to emphasize a big appreciation for uh, Cigarette Surfboard and all of the community groups that called in and are doing the work every day persistently, consistently. Thank you. Uh, we can only do this together, and we will keep moving forward. And um, your recommendations, as well as the county recommendations, have been incorporated into the motion. Thank you. And just thank you, Tara, and, and the work of the county for, for bringing this presentation to us as well.
Okay, are there any other? I will move on to a roll call vote. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkin? Aye. Mayor Brunner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. I will now move on into our agenda for oral communications. Thank you for hanging with us. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions will be on your screen. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. You will have two minutes to speak. Members of the public who are joining us in person and wish to speak, please line up to the right of the dais, my left. You will have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name in the meeting minutes at the clipboard at the front. However, it's not required. Please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has completed. Uh, we do have a couple of attendees uh, virtually as well as in person, so I'm going to alternate. I will now call the first person in person. Thank you for waiting. Please step forward to the dais and make sure the microphone is at your uh, mouth level. Perfect. Sounds like it's on. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Greta Mitchell and I'm a senior at Santa Cruz High School and I'm also our Associate Student Body President this year and I'm here today representing a much larger group of students that could not make it due to prior commitments and things they had to do instead um, of be here with us even though they wanted to. But I've come to address the parking situation at Santa Cruz High School and the effect it has on our learning, engagement, and success at school. And I would first like to highlight the fact that we are not here to complain, but rather to shed a light on the situation that really does have a large impact on us as students. And I would also like to share my gratitude for the increase of street parking from two hours to four hours. So thank you all for that. Um, and to move on, as you all know, Santa Cruz High is in the middle of our community, which makes it difficult to construct a large parking lot like many other schools nearby do have, which in turn makes parking a ongoing problem for students and even staff at Santa Cruz High. So when we run out of parking spots, we are left with the only option of parking on streets where our permits do not allow us to park all day, which results in many tickets that happen weekly in stress regarding the financial ability to pay them as they continue to add up every month. And for students who need to, cars to get campus, get to campus, it is disheartening to get fined just for trying to attend school as other students at high schools nearby do not have to deal with this issue. And having our parking increase to four hours does help, but for students who have obligations during lunch, like tests and office hours or clubs, moving their cars means that they have to push aside activities which are beneficial to succeeding in school and passing their classes. And I do have some more, but I'll leave it at that. So thank you guys. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public in person, Hi there, welcome. Hi, my name is Milan. I'm a junior at Santa Cruz High, and our goal is to change our two-hour parking to eight-hour parking because right now we are expected, if we don't want to get a ticket, to move our car three times a day, which doesn't really make sense. And recently you guys came up with the idea to change it to four-hour parking, which I'm grateful about, but I'm at school for longer than four hours, so I actually brought my ticket <laughs> here to show you that four-hour parking didn't really make a difference for me. Um, um, we should not be worrying about parking tickets in class, and um, lots of times I'm in class waiting for a hall pass to come back so I can go run and move my car so I don't get another ticket, because as of right now, this is $120. Um, and 
first, it also doesn't change, make a difference to when we move our car because there's not enough spots to move them to. So we're just like literally just trading spots with our friends and it doesn't work on the same street, which makes no sense. Um, most of our spots are taken up by construction as well. So like right now, if I was gonna like put in perspective within all of you, like if you all paid for parking, like probably two of you would actually get a parking spot and you'd have to fight for, you'd have to get here early and fight for a <laughs> parking spot. Um, the other day I got out of class and I saw a tar parking ticket on pretty much every car I walked past, which seemed crazy to me. Um, also, I right now I'm currently working two minimum wage jobs and I'm gonna have to pay myself, so I don't see how it, this is like acceptable for high school students to have to pay $60 per ticket. And um, high, Santa Cruz High has been there since 1897, so people have been saying that the reason that we're getting tickets is because the neighbors are complaining, but they know that they're moving by a school and they know I understand that the consequences they're getting by the next to school. So I think that that's important. And that's why I think it should be at our eight hour parking instead. Thank you. I'm going to um, alternate to our one of our virtual attendees. Uh, the first name is I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. OK, thanks. Hey, since someone did finally take down the overstayed queer pride flag on the Civic Auditorium, I'll skip a full continuation of my comments of last meeting, but did want to mention you were in violation of the May 2020 resolution authorizing such a display as it only sanctioned display throughout the month of June. Isn't violating your own resolutions a no-no? I will mention that all people are entitled to their own personal moral or any opinions about anything, whatever they are, such as mine, that the far left elements of government, including their public school teacher, queer crusading indoctrinators and trans right activists have gone too far and are starting to produce harm to children and others. I wish I had time here to go into more of that. As to measure L and K, I'll vote no on L and K and hope it's bought back without the communist teacher subsidy housing angle. The proponents say the 228 million in 2016 bonds only made half the needed school improvements, but these measures are holding the public up for a much more 371 million, partly because of building government employee add-on subsidized housing and a self-serving benefit that ignores the lost land cost of permanently using up public land in a giveaway benefit that does nothing for children but pad teachers' pocketbooks at local public, not state, expense plus interest that we'll be paying on for 25 to 40 years. I have no desire to see a Prop 13 end around bond measure cause property taxes to go up 360 bucks for the rest of my life, even uh, partly to line the pockets of teachers who, if they have a problem with pay, should take it up with their employer. I wonder what the rent will be and who and for what that money goes to. I'll bet it doesn't go back to the taxpayers. We play penny, pay plenty in taxes, and if it isn't getting to teachers, it's not because we aren't paying enough taxes. I suppose somehow the real problem with uneven teacher pay is corruption and an uneven distribution of taxes since the California average teacher salary is reportedly 97,000 a year. And almost unbelievably, some teachers in California make an unconscionable three to 400,000 in pay and benefits. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have another person attending us virtually, Michelle Lee. Hello, um, my name is Michelle Lee. Good evening. Um, I've just come and called here today because um, I'd like to express my strong support of the installation of a community historical marker that would be placed on Water Street Bridge to memorialize, honor, and remember the stories of Francisco Arias and Jose Chimales. I think that it's time for Santa Cruz to begin and have a conversation on the historical wrongs that are embedded in the history of the city, unlike many others that have gathered here will also like to express. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. Our next member attending virtually is Bodhi Shargo. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful, it didn't pop up. Um, thank you council for listening to um, oral communications. Um, I want to take this as uh, an opportunity to talk about, uh, you know, intersectionality and the writing of historical wrongs, um, because 
we're at, a, at an interesting um, day in our history. Uh, I, I grew up in Felton, um, where there used to be a very strong KKK presence um, in, in our past, and it showed me that our, our town has a much uglier history than we talk about uh, very often. Uh, and one of the darkest parts of that history was the, the lynching of two Latino men in 1877. And in 2018, the council voted to approve the installation of a historical marker on Water Street Bridge to memorialize that tragedy, uh, a marker which still hasn't been installed. So I'm, I'm giving this comment today to, to urge the council to move forward to install that marker to address our, our past of, of bigotry and, and hate in Santa Cruz, um, acknowledge it. But then I believe that we have to go further uh, than just acknowledging it. Because while we don't see this same uh, violence quite as often anymore, we, we see different types of bigotry and, and, and hate that, that harms our Latinx community and other oppressed communities in the same way. Uh, and, and people were outside the council protesting against that today, uh, urging for city workers and union workers to get a fair contract. So I hope that the council can move to address our past of, of ugliness and bigotry by installing a historical marker on the Water Street Bridge and can do the active work to right those wrongs today by addressing the needs of SEIU city workers and giving them a fair contract. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. The last person virtually is Sabina Holber, and then I'll continue with in person. Go ahead and unmute yourself, star six. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, welcome. Thank you. Hi. Um, so right now we're in about the waning hour or so left of Rosh Hashanah, and I'd like to wish everyone a happy new year and Shana Tova. Um, but I wanted to call in today because at previous council me meetings and today earlier, there's been a caller that's called in and uses an anti-Semitic slur. Um, I've heard other callers in the past before be cut off or kicked off their comments because they were using foul or offensive language. Um, and as a member of the Jewish community, I would like to ask that if somebody calls in and talks about the globalist elite, it is not, um, it's not a dog whistle. We all know what they're talking about. And so please support the Jewish community and don't allow this in council chambers going forward. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next, I have in person. Hi there. Welcome. Hi. Um, my name is Corinne Steven. I'm a senior at Santa Cruz High School. And Greta and Milan already covered most of it, but I just wanted to add on a few more facts and issues that I've experienced um, with the parking at Santa Cruz High. Um, first of all, I have noticed that it is a safety issue because many people drive around crazy trying to find spots and to not be late to class. And personally, I have noticed that I have gotten the most tardies I've ever gotten in this one chunk of the school year so far than I ever have because I can never find a spot and I always have to move my car. So um, also, I have seen many times people are just racing around and because they're trying to find a spot and people almost get hit. Um, also, a lot of people can't get rides to school because their parents are working or um, it also just wastes money and gas driving around trying to find a spot. And also break time, usually when we run around and try to find a spot, it is supposed to be time for us to eat, go to the bathroom and also just not stress and have a break. That is why it is called break. And um, instead, we are racing around in our cars, trying to find a spot, and it just adds on a whole bunch of more stress. And I've noticed I'm always really hungry because I never have time to eat because I'm jumping in my car, running around trying to get a spot, and there's no spots. And then I'm late, so that's another thing. Um, basically, there's also one spot that's very confusing. I have gotten a ticket before. There's like a spot at the front of the school where it's two hour and then a little section right next to it where you can't park. And that was confusing for me 
but if we could just at least put the time up a little bit, that would be better. Maybe eight hours, that would be best. Um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, in person, hi there. Welcome. Hi, my name is Lucy Clow. I'm the ASB Vice President at Santa Cruz High School, and I also wanted to add on to the parking situation at Santa Cruz High. Um, every day, many of my friends and peers at Santa Cruz High School make the difficult decision on whether they should move their car and be late to class or risk getting a $60 ticket. And I think that this is a very unfair um, position to put high school students through um, because tickets are very expensive and a lot of people do not have jobs to afford them. And yeah, um, also like Corinne was saying, the problem where safety issues and how people are rushing around looking for spots puts a lot of risk on students and I don't think it's fair for people to be rushing around during time when they should be eating and getting ready for their next class where they should be focusing on school and their education rather than spending money on tickets. So yes, um, thank you. Thank you for your comment. We have one person virtually I'll, I'll go to, phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Oh, well, members of the community, this is Robert Norris. I'm with Huff Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. I watched Chapter 3, Phase 3, of the destruction of dozens of survival tents in the city mangler Matt Huffaker's Crunch, Compress, and uh, well, that pretty much covers it, the tents and the living space of Benchland residents today. The false narrative the city is providing accessible shelter, accessible indoor shelter, is misleading the community and I think misleading the council itself. There is no accessible alternate shelter either for the folks in the bench lands or for the folks more broadly in the community. You're adding up the pallets, the tents and the overlook and armory and the few vacancies that they happen at 1220 River Street, there's nowhere near enough space to offer shelter for the hundreds in the bench lands, much less the hundreds everywhere else. Instead, the city is operating what is uh, alternately a de facto vice, shoving the fleeing residents like sardines into smaller and smaller spaces. The city is creating a true health hazard, which it will again take the courts to unravel. Many of us are, are dazed, confused, bewildered, I'm a little sick myself, uh, by this robotic decimation of the bench lands. It's happening at the same time that Footbridge Services is closing. That's the services, in spite of all their good work, that provided emergency shelter that the city would not warming shelter, which the city would not, storage space, which the city would not. So many are angry and desperate as they see their homes of two years bulldozed. Will the broader community, and I don't know, tolerate this, this latest chapter or the next cruel chapter of this Benchlands demolition? I can only hope it's a long struggle. If you didn't show today, keep alert. Show up to the next time that folks need your presence. I appeal to members of the community. Thank you for your comment. Our next member of the public here in person. Hi there, welcome. Awesome. When I started this, uh, first off, uh, I want to show solidarity with our workers who have been here today. Uh, my name is Ray Diaz. I'm a student at UC Santa Cruz, and I serve as the labor commissioner for the Work Student Solidarity Coalition and the Black Student Union. So I would urge this council to meet the demands of the workers that are here today and uh, meet the demands of workers who are going to come in the future and are going to be here striking on Monday. Uh, but in other terms, I do serve in a number of roles at UCSC, but most importantly, I am a proud Chicano. My barrio is Santana, and here in the city of Santa Cruz, Francisco Arias and Jose Chamales were lynched in the city of Santa Cruz in the year of 1877. On August 27, 2019, the Santa Cruz City Council passed a motion to approve the recommendation from the Historical Preservation Commission to create a subcommittee of individuals with demonstrated historical expertise to develop a recommendation for an interpretive plaque acknowledging this incident. 140 year, 145 years later, there's still no marker. 
the students who spoke today and who are going to speak after myself is an example of Chicano power and solidarity. So I urge this council to finish what it started and begin to heal from this historical wrong. And I encourage you to finish the marker. Include Chicano, Latina, and indigenous voices in this process and immediately install, install a historical communal marker. Gracias. And this, to remind you folks, is the history of Santa Cruz. And I don't want you all to forget that. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. Next, we have the next member of the public. Hello, council. Uh, my name is... Oh, God. <clears throat> My name is Zenon Elliott Crow, and I'm here to show solidarity and support uh, with Ray Diaz and many others with the uh, installation of the community historical marker on the Water Street Bridge. Uh, we need to honor, remember, and reckon with our past as a city, and I really, really support uh, the efforts to go ahead and create that memorial for Francisco Arias and Jose Jamalas. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public, welcome. I'm Alon Wilkerson. I'm also a UC Santa Cruz student, and I'm also here in strong support of the installation of the community historical marker to be placed on Water Street Bridge to memorize, honor, and remember the stories of Francisco Arias and um, Jose Chamales. I would just like to recognize that it's not an excuse of COVID anymore. This hasn't been installed in years, and it's pushing back the history that Santa Cruz is afraid to actually confront. This has happened in Santa Cruz. Recognize it and learn from it. And I strongly hope that you guys do it as fast as possible because students here who actually have work to do, have things to study for, are coming here and telling you guys to help out and do this for us. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public who would like to speak for oral communications? Any items not? on the agenda. Okay, I um, would like to just quickly address a couple of the points that were brought up during oral communications and then I will go out to council. Um, one is the Water Street Bridge plaque, which we did receive, um, it looks like five uh, callers. Uh, I did receive a voicemail from Ray Diaz. Thank you, and as well as some community emails. I was unaware of this previous council direc direction since it happened before I was on council, but I am currently, as the mayor, reviving that uh, committee to uh, continue this work and look at that with the Historical Preservation Commission, as well as other stakeholders, and I'm happy um, to outreach with with everybody who commented on this item uh, to keep everyone updated as we move forward with what I've learned is a very uh, tragic, devastating incident. So um, thank you everyone uh, for that. Um, I would also like to um, um, uh, Santa Cruz High School parking. I see that uh, our parking public works director, Mark Dettel, is here. And I'm wondering, I have a couple questions, if you would be able to kind of clarify so that we can help direct some support for, for that. It sounds like um, recently, so I guess my first question is, what has changed? Were students, it seems like this is a new dilemma of getting parking tickets. Um, it sounds like it was recently increased from two to four hours. Um, is it that more students are driving or there's construction or both? Do you have any uh, data on that? That's a very good question. Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works. Um, that parking program has been in place for many, many years. Um, what has changed is the school is doing some construction on site. And so they've taken away uh, some of the on site areas for parking as well as impacted some of the services they provided on site. And then the contractors that are working on site are taking up some of the spaces that historically were used for parking. Bonnie, can you put that map up? Let me just give you some context of where the parking is around the school. 
And if you see Santa Cruz High in the green area in the center, um, it's the the yellow portion on your um, on the left is Mission Street, and then it's bordered by Walnut Street that goes down to Lincoln, as well as Laurel Street, and then goes all the way down to Chestnuts. Kind of boxes that area in. All the areas in red are parking areas that, that students are able to park at, but with a two, used to be a two hour limit. I think the other thing that, and then when this came to my attention a few weeks ago, um, I reached out to the campus manager, Steve Arnold, and just to get understanding of what was going on as well as our traffic enforcement to find out how it was being enforced. And he, he say he requested if we could change that from two to four hours for permit period. He figured that would cover most of the issues. Um, and so um, we agreed to do that. And so you can see on this map, um, it is instructing the two hour to be, we're giving a four hour parking on the, on the streets that are indicated on red. So there's quite a bit of parking available. Um, it sounds like some of the students the information didn't go out to the students directly and they weren't all informed about that. Um, Mr. Arnold is working on that. Um, this is one program where it's actually managed by the school. The school issues the permits. Um, we do not issue them. And so they can determine how they're issued, if they want to give priority to carpools, if they want to give it priority to people that live in Davenport or outside the area. That's really up to them how they issue those permits. The, the city doesn't do so um, we do the enforcement just like um, we do the enforcement or in the west side where the if the UC students uh, impact neighborhoods or by the beach where the, the visitors impact neighbors um, as well as um, around uh, major uh, users as far as the, the Sutter Health, um, we have uh, parking permits there. There is a parking pr process that the residents can regress, request a parking permit. We survey the neighborhood, takes a vote of 75% of the residents. And so this, that's how this was put in place. So um, I requested that we do a four hour as in lieu of two hour um, enforcement for the remainder of the school year. And then if we want, during that time period, there's time to relook at the program and if they want to go out and reevaluate or re, um, redesign the program so it works for everybody, um, that, that gives us time to work that out. So. Do you have a, an idea or have you been informed of the construction timeline? Is this? I, I have not, but Mr. Okay. Arnold didn't really tell me that. Um, okay, uh, and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Merritt. And, um, Many of the members of the public who are here present are gone. Um, <laughs> so um, I just had a couple comments related to um, what was discussed at um, in oral communications. Um, the first of which is um, obviously this parking issue is having significant impacts on Santa Cruz High students. And since this is not on our agenda, I don't think that we probably can go into great detail. So I'd actually like to, to make a motion that we put this item, we put an item on the agenda prior to the last meeting in December to address weekday parking issues around Santa Cruz High. Second. Okay, we have a motion on the table to direct this item to a future agenda before December December our, our December 13th, before our December 13th meeting. May I get a roll call vote? Councilmember Kalantaria Johnson. Uh, Golder? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with Council Member Kalantari Johnson absent. And then I have a few comments and questions on the other item. Um, so, as um, some members of the public brought up, the um, Water Street Bridge plaque went through the Historic Preservation Commission, um, and they uh, made some recommendations to council back in 2019. 
um, and then direction was uh, given to continue working on this. I actually had been in touch with, because I think Jeff Dunn was one of the people who had been reached out to on this item. And so I just want to suggest maybe um, touching base with him to see kind of who the other people were that were working on this, because it was a, um, it was more of a community group that was working on this, not so much an ad hoc subcommittee with council members. And so I was maybe thinking that at the next meeting, if the city manager during the city manager report can just give an update on kind of where this process is at and provide some feedback to the community on their concerns with this, maybe can help us get a sense of where this is at, how it's moving forward, and then um, we can kind of take any action from there that's necessary. Oh, we can certainly do that, Councilmember Cummings. Uh, the mayor and I have been in discussions about uh, how best to proceed from here to get the process restarted. So um, we can plan on bringing an update back as part of the next city manager update at that time. Thank you. And that concludes my comments. Um, I did have one more um, question. If we can have some type of, um, if you can, if staff can speak, or maybe the homelessness response team can speak to um, the next homelessness update regarding footbridge services closing and some of those services and updates um, and impacts. Thank you. If I could just say, I have, um, I somehow became the holder of the documentation from the oh, Water Street, so I can, I'd be happy to share this so you can take it and do whatever would be helpful with it. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I know. Wow. I, I pulled it out because I was talking with my students about 5,000 lynchings of Mexican citizens. And um, I, um, anyway, it, it, so I have it, and hopefully it'll help. The history not talked about. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I will now, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening.